Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about E3, Day 2, 2018. Yes, for, for a very brief window of time, we are no longer the Weekly Stuff, Jonathan. We are the Daily Stuff. We're the Daily Stuff. Yes. For, for this sad moment of E3 we live in. <laughs> that, that, you know, we, this has been a decompressed E3 because it started on Saturday and we had some of it on Sunday. And then you, it used to be you would have four press conferences on Monday by this... Felt like because we had three, we had two, we had two and a half, two and a quarter, we had maybe press conferences. Yeah. But this day was just eaten up by E3 for me. In oh, a way it was that I'd forgotten yes. about for me too. Uh, if you didn't listen yesterday, yesterday is when we covered Bethesda, Microsoft, and EA, and we are back today to cover Sony. Ubisoft, Ubisoft yep. as you've you told me, software. and Square Enix, maybe, kind of? I mean, we'll talk about we'll it. We'll talk about there's, it. There's, two, there's there were there were more new games, I believe, in assets on Square Enix's thing than on Ubisoft, so we have to okay. talk about well, it. Well, there you go. Um, I actually feel more positive after today's E3 than yesterday's. It was a fun day, I thought, mm. and we're coming off the Sony presser, which was fucking amazing. So. Yeah, they, they, it was it was because we had the two sort of like leaner ones, and even Ubisoft, we didn't have any two hour no. extravaganzas. You know, the longest one was Ubisoft with ninety minutes, so it was definitely a leaner day. Although I thought the 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 press conferences were more inconsistent. You know, okay. Like I think even though Microsoft's because there's kind of with the Microsoft one, there's the two levels of looking at it. Of what does it do for the Microsoft like brand? Is says like in three years, my, Xbox might be good. If you're looking at it for how many like cool video games did they show? They showed a lot of cool video games. There's just the ones I'm not going to play on an Xbox. I guess they. But my issue with Xbox, as I said yesterday, is that they go on for 17 hours and they show every video game that is coming out on Earth. Right. And it's too much and it's bad because it is so poorly paced. Like I love the Sony approach, particularly this year, of they picked four fucking games. And they showed them in depth. They had amazing demo. Every single one of those four games, yeah. unbelievable what they showcased. And then a couple of goodies in between those. Weird break early on, which we'll talk about. But other than that, like, and it was a lean, lean-ish 70 minutes. Like, yeah. it was, I think, stunning. Ubisoft was too long and had some digressions, but it also had some of my favorite moments of the show so far. And Square Enix was nothing and completely worthless. So we'll get to that. Yeah. But yeah, um, interesting day. I also had fun today because after the Ubisoft show, I could not resist and I cut together an Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Mario Odyssey trailer. Did you watch that yet, Sean? No, I didn't know that you did this. All right, we're going to play that live for Sean on the podcast. Just give me a second here. <laughs> okay. All right, so there you go, Sean. Pause the podcast to show you that. Yes, it, it is. I, I don't know why you did that. It, it is very funny. It is off on our YouTube channel <laughs> there right you now. Go. Our it hot, is new, hot new video. Yes, it is called Super Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and you can search for that. And I was kind of editing it furiously because I knew once we had Assassin's Creed Odyssey footage, a lot of people were going to do that. Uh-huh, yes. So, I think I'm pretty sure Polygon already did it. Oh, okay. I, I didn't watch the video. I only saw I haven't it seen a Polygon do it. Else. Anyway, uh, yes. mine has more heart in it. Yes, it's it's an indie production. You indie know? production. Yeah, it was fun. It was sponsored by Big Video Game. Yes. So you know, it was uh, it was good. That was my favorite part of the day. And also, I'll have to say, wasn't that impressed by Assassin's Creed Odyssey when I was watching the show? By the time I finished editing that, I'm like, yeah, this game looks okay. Yeah, like I'm I'm kind of conflicted on it, but it, yeah. it looks good. I like yeah. Greece. Yeah, I spent a lot of time like looking at Assassin's Greece. Creed Odyssey footage, so it pretty much looks. Identical to Assassin's Creed Origin. Yes, yeah. So it looks like it could be DLC for that game, but I've heard good things from people who actually played it. So yeah. anyway, we'll get into all of that. But uh, any other overall thoughts on today, Sean? Um, one thing I just want to shout out because I have you know because we're recording these podcasts obviously the night of after a lot of these these conferences, and so yeah. I, we don't have a lot of time to sort of get like like cool on the stuff. Like we the the Sony press conference ended twenty minutes ago from us recording this. And I spent a lot of last night after we finished recording the podcast in this morning watching the Cyberpunk trailer like five or six times. 
That fucking trailer is amazing. Like, it, it was really good seeing it one time, but it's so densely packed yeah. that it is the kind of trailer that you just have to watch and pause every two seconds and just look at it for a bit. I need to watch it, go back and watch it in actual, like, HD and not yeah. really crappy streaming yes, quality. Yes, that is another thing. Yeah. that it, it looks so good. It is so, it is way more Ghost in the Shell than I realized watching it live at the end of the Microsoft press conference. And so for people who just watched it attached to the Microsoft conference, fucking just watch that video a couple of times through. There's so much awesome stuff jam-packed in there. It's really good. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to kick it off with uh, Square Enix? Let's, let's kick it off this morning. Square Enix showed up on YouTube, and they're like, Did hey, they? Guys. Did they? Yosuke, Yosuke Matsuda, the CEO of Square Enix, was there, and he said, we're, 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 We made some video games. When it started, I was actually kind of looking forward to it. Because I'm like, oh, yeah. they're doing this Nintendo Direct style. Yep. Where it's pre-recorded. It's a video package. They've got some stuff to show. That always works well for Nintendo. Nintendo's, like, Directs are always quick and to the point, And they show good stuff. And whether or not you're going to play it, you're like, okay, you're not wasting my time. Yeah. But maybe, well, how long did it take before we realize they were wasting our time? Um, when the second, second thing they showed was a Final Fantasy XIV expansion. And, okay. and when the first thing they showed was something that we had seen not 12 hours ago. A, not a Final Fantasy XIV expansion. Oh. A, a patch for a Final Fantasy XIV expansion that came out last summer. Okay. Yeah. That's what I, that was. I, I don't, I am not following anything about Final Fantasy XIV, so when they said stuff like Stormblood and Moonlight, I was like, I don't know what any of that means. Storm, it's new. Stormblood came out last year. That was like okay. their second big expansion. That was their, like, you know, like a, like a World of Warcraft kind of, one of their big expansions, like Panda. Orgy or whatever it was called. Mr. Pandaria. But no, that's okay. yep. Pand Orgy. That's what I want the next World of Warcraft to be. Um, you know, they have to dig deep into the <laughs> yes. Warcraft lore. It's like, well, in one of the books, there's this weird sentence that says that pandas love to fuck. I don't even know how that got in there. But we have to make a new expansion, so here we go. We're very punchy. It's yeah. the end of day two. Anyway, um, Stormblood. And then the, the Moonlight thing was, it's like version 4.1.2. So that's how deep they were scraping off yeah. the barrel. And Final Fantasy XIV is a great game. Just weird thing to show like that. Yeah. And it was just, yeah. So the Square Enix thing was like 30 minutes long. Yeah. It, it, it might have even come in a little bit under that. It, it was very thin. And the weirdest thing about it is that we know that they're working on like three or four pretty significant games that they didn't talk about or show or do anything with at all. No, but we'll. But let's let's just kind of go through a sure. little bit of what they showed. So the best thing is that Keith David was emceeing it. He was narrating. Over that was it. great. I. It was it, like that became exceedingly weird as the show went on when you realized that how short it was going to be. Of like, why? Do you, I mean, Keith David's awesome. I'll take Keith David narrating anything, and I love that we have now on like record. Keith David calling Nier Automata a masterpiece. We so, do. like, that that voice clip is there. I should, like, get that as my fucking, like, ringtone or something. But it's, like, it's set in, like, the fabric of the universe now because Keith David said it. Yes. Um, but, yeah, so they he sort of, like, did some of the transition stuff. But, anyways, so the first thing they showed was Shadow of the Tomb Raider made his triumphant return from the Microsoft <laughs> press conference stage from about 12 hours earlier. Um... Let's see, they showed, what because they showed like a trailer, and then they showed a, a game demo that was like, okay in theory, but was so like, just watching somebody play like a five minute stealth sequence of that game that did not build up. It was, it was like if you watched only like the very, very, like, like a very truncated part of The Last of Us 2 one. Of like, it was just some of the sneaking around, and that was kind of it, and it didn't accelerate into this big chase and everything else that you'd expect it to. It's like, no, this is just someone very competently playing a stealth game in like a very, like, lackluster sequence. I, I had a couple problems with this. One was, normally I don't complain about the streaming quality on these things, because it is what it is, but there is also a reason why generally companies don't pick a scene from their game set in the pitch dark of night yeah, where like point. camouflage and color are important because you could not see what was going on in this. Uh, at least I couldn't because it was all giant macro blocks. Square Enix's stream was having a bunch of trouble this morning. And so it was just a nightmare to actually look at. And what there was there was Lara Croft killing people in the most brutal ways imaginable for five minutes. And here is one issue I do have with all the Shadow of the Tomb Raider marketing so far is it has been 100% what we have seen, built around Lara Croft brutally murdering people. Yep. And that's not what those games are. That's what those games I have I played that first them. one. I blew brutally murdered the fuck out of you, a lot of people in that you game. You do. 
Is that the main reason you would recommend Tomb Raider to someone? No, but but, that, but the, these this is E three. This is they're marketing these games to a bunch of blood hungry fucking okay. hounds. Uh, you know, Uncharted does not have to come and, and have Nathan Drake like you know. Yeah, but Nathan Drake doesn't fucking throw a climbing axe in people's heads like the large, the Tomb Raider. I. It is I want to play that first one, but it is more like violent than it, than Uncharted is. It absolutely is, but my point is there's a balance here, and I don't like that they're leaning so hard on that in the trailers. Be- you know, I hope that the developer did come out at the end yeah. and say, we also have a bigger world than we've built before, we have more tombs, they're yeah, dangerous, they're exciting. Here, this Tomb Raider game, we will feature tombs, I believe. But it was so. just, it's like, it does, and it isn't honestly an issue I have a little bit with the entire rebooted franchise, is, is how much it leans into some of the yeah. violent stuff, because I don't... I was having this conversation with my brother earlier today. There's a level where you can do it and it's just fun and cartoony, which is kind of how Uncharted approaches it, that you're not yeah. actually thinking about how many people Nathan Drake has killed because they don't stop to think about it. Tomb Raider stops to think about it and then goes back into it more grisly than it was before, yeah. but never actually stops to think about what would that actually do to the human psyche of any given person murdering that many people that brutally. Yeah. And so if you open the can of worms, you kind of have to dive into it, and they have never dived into it, but they really want the credit for opening the can of worms and it is such a weird push and pull that i hope if i have any worry about this game it's that i think the other two didn't stray too far across that line to stop being enjoyable i worry this one is going to be so much like like there are shots of, this of Lara literally like covered in blood like basking in the moonlight yeah. i i don't know what where they're going with that yeah it had like a weird sort of rambo yes. predator like almost like like a much more violent Metal Gear Solid 3 kind of yes. because it had like all that kind of jungle stuff and her like covering herself in mud and then for me the thing that was the most brutal was probably when she just like strings a dude up by the neck and then like wraps him up around that branch and just yeah. leaves and it's like fuck like what like why 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 that dude that way everybody else you just slit their throat and it's like you know I don't think I don't want to get slit my throat slit but if I were to have to be murdered by a crazy lady I would rather have my throat slit than have her hang me from a tree. <laughs> I guess no. all, yeah. I guess all I will say is maybe the balance in the final game will be just right and it'll be really good. Yeah. But just like, comp- I can't help compare it to the Last of Us Two demo we all just watched, where that one is just as violent, if not more. It's maybe more violent. More violent. Definitely, definitely more violent. But also look how it couches it in a very human framework that, yeah. even within that ten minute demo contextualizes thematically the violence. I'm not saying every demo has to do that, but Naughty Dog is not just selling us on gore, and yeah. that's a di- that is a fundamental difference for me. And it, and it is also just something of it is highlighted more when the demo is bad. Not yes. because I'm not saying the demo is bad because I think the game's going to be bad. I think they structured the demo poorly yes. and picked a bad section that didn't have pacing to it. It didn't evolve. It, it felt like I just sort of like Ended up watching a weird, like, five-minute excerpt of someone's, like, silent Let's Play of Shadow of the Tomb Raider where they're just going through this normal stealth section. Which, when you're playing a game, that's fine that you have, like, a normal stealth section where you're just sneaking through and and stealth killing people. When you're giving the demo, it has to have an ebb and flow and feature things and, and change. Or I was just very bored by the end of that demo and waiting for what's going to be the big twist or something that happens to sort of spice things up. Yeah, not trying to be too negative. I already have this game pre-ordered. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to have to finish it in a week to make room for Spider-Man. Yeah. So there you go. What was next? Next was the Final Fantasy XIV stuff that is the, the patch 4.3. Um, there is Monster Hunter World stuff, I guess, in Final Fantasy XIV. Yeah, I didn't understand what that was. There was a cute animation of all the characters together doing a little dance and then drinking a potion. Yes. That, that was They fun. all gave the thumbs up. I like that. Yes. Then was was Captain Spirit, the, the Don't Nod, Life is Strange 2 prequel thing. Um, but this is where they, because they had, for all of these, they did have, like, or for most of these, they had little interviews with the developers, and in this one, the developers did literally use the phrase, Life is Strange Expanded Universe. Yes. So it was like, that's a, it's, it seems like it's an anthology series, it doesn't, Expanded Universe is something different. The L-I-S-E-U. Yeah. We're all going to be saying it. Hashtag yeah. L-I-S-E-U. Yep. It's coming next year. It's, it's great. I can't wait for Don't Nod to expand enough that they just make their own E3 showcase with all yes. their Life is Strange titles. L-I-S-E-U E32019 <laughs> I think we need to reboot Jonathan. I think he's, he's broken down. I've typed a lot of hashtags today, Sean. There, This was a very hashtag heavy E3 for sure. Yes. Um, but yeah, that Captain Spirit stuff was looks fine. It was the looks same fine. stuff they showed on Microsoft stage. Yeah, we're, we're pretty firmly into the, oh, this is a Microsoft recap panel. Yes. 
But the next thing is it, the next thing is them showing a game that has been released in a certain section of the world for over a year. But Dragon Quest XI, yes, looks cool. Great trailer. Yeah, like, it's, it's a really solid trailer. The art style looks so fucking good. so good. It would be way more sort of excited. Like I haven't played it, but I could play it. Yes. And so it's like for me, there's like a psychological thing of like this looks like a trailer for a game that's already released, but it's. But it's not for most people. They're doing a really thorough localization on it. There are lots of great UK accents on on display in that localization. If you've read anything about this, they're also making some pretty hefty changes to the game or, like, additions to um, make it maybe more palatable to a Western audience. Like, it did feel cool to have Dragon Quest XI getting that big a pitch at E3. And this game looks amazing. It's coming out smack dab September 4th in the middle of everything else. But uh, I can't wait. Uh, and I also liked that while they have created a crappy new uh, Western cover art that is not an Akira Toriyama illustration, which I think is heresy, yeah. they do have a reversible cover when you buy it that has the actual Akira Toriyama cover illustration. So you can just buy the game, pop it out, put it back yeah. in, and never have to look at that other cover again. I do like that trend of developers being like, look, we can't, like, the publisher is making us put this shitty fucking buy. Like, they passed this shit through, like, a hundred different, like, weird ad agencies. Right. That, like chemically distill this terrible box art, but we can still put good box art in. You just have yeah. to do a little bit of work. Just call me crazy. In a you know, a country that watches Dragon Ball Super so much we shut down Crunchyroll every Saturday night uh-huh, yeah. or would when it was still on. I don't think putting Akira Toriyama's hand drawn art on the cover of your game is a downside. No. I really don't. I think there's a possibility that people might walk into Best Buy and go what is that? I love Dragon Ball. Uh-huh. Oh, it says Akira Toriyama on the back. Maybe I'll buy this. Not an ad expert, just spitballing here. I mean, they it's again, it's chemically distilled in a way that is is taken yes. all the personality and flavor out. Oh well, looks good. Yep. Glad they're doing it. Still no 3DS port, but oh well. Uh, next up was this is a sort of a surprise new game announcement. It's called Babylon's Fall. It was just a trailer. Um, it, but the, like the thing that was interesting about it, they should have honestly put this at the beginning of the trailer to like make it be like, oh, this is something I should pay attention to is that it's being developed by Platinum Games. I actually had that feeling because I was it started I was like, oh, Robo, and I was like looking on Twitter at something, and then it was like, like oh, Platinum Games. Oh, I'm like, can I rewind that? Like, yeah. what was that? <laughs> yeah, it 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 looked like it was sort of high fantasy stuff. It was it had this weird. The beginning of the trailer was just them moving through like a sort of very elaborate calendar looking thing with like all these different eras and ages that were like 5420 CE and I don't know if that's supposed to mean like common era like actually like 3000 years in the future is when this game is set I don't know I was confused by that I was because it had no context it was just a yeah. totally contextless trailer no developer talking about it anything it had a very Dark Souls looking knight dude at the end who had some weird magic shit fly out of his shoulder and attack a monster yes and that looked cool but nothing else about the game. So Platinum Games made near, but we're not assuming this is another Yoko Taro? The, no, this is okay. definitely not. If they, this was a, another collaboration with Yoko Taro, they would have said, for sure. Yes, I assume so. Um, yeah. Speaking of Yoko Taro, they, they put Nier Automata, the Xbox One port, on this. Exact this same ad as it is, it is literally the exact same ad. The only good thing about it was that Keith David got to say, you know, a masterpiece finds a new home. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Dear Automata is a masterpiece. I would love Keith David to look at any of my work and say something nice about it. Yes. I, I, I hope that made Yoko Taro very pleased. Yes. But yeah, no, that's just, that was it. It felt very, it felt even more desperate than when it was showed on Microsoft stage yeah. because it was already shown on Microsoft stage. It's like, I, why does, why do the people watching the Square Enix press conference give a shit that Nier is coming to Xbox? The people watching the Square Enix press conference already have played near and on the PlayStation. Like, but hey, yeah. I assume Yoko Taro was sitting at home snorting meth through a pixie stick or something, yeah. and he that very dude, much enjoyed that. That dude does not need drugs. Okay. He, is, he is himself the drug. Okay. Um, next up, we got a good trailer for um, Octopath Traveler, which is we coming did? out July 13th. Yep. That game looks cool. Looks great. It's about to come out, so I don't know if there's yeah. anything more to say about it, but it looks cool. We will. I will talk about it on the podcast later this year. Yes. Probably. Yeah. In, in like a month. Yes. Just Cause 4. I Again, also... in the, the like sloppy seconds of the Microsoft E3 press conference. Why would you just... I mean, we'll get to the meta of it later, I guess. Yeah. It really is, at this point, it was baffling of like, either give Microsoft all your stuff or host your own show, but don't do both. Yeah. It's so... They, they went a little bit more in depth, I guess. There is extreme weather. 
Which is actually, actually, I don't want to say they went more in depth because they basically just said things that were very easily inferable by watching the trailer you saw at Microsoft. Yes. That like you could see that there was a giant, gigantic tornado. You didn't then need a developer to tell you, oh, there are gigantic tornadoes in yes. our game because of an extreme weather system. Um, you know, like I, am not just cause doesn't really do anything for me. The one thing I do want to like sort of talk about a little bit because it. Watching the Just Cause 4 thing kind of reminded me of this. And then I think it came up again. What was... Oh, at Trials on the Ubisoft stage made me feel this. Of There's this whole weird strand of video games this like that have come out relatively recently that started out like kind of serious but with like a tongue-in-cheek goofy side to it that has gone so far and it's just utterly completely absurd. Trials is like that where we got the new Trials game trailer and it's just like no... Basis, it's like just here's this game that used to be like we kind of have fun with it, but it is like this kind of like serious skill based game, and then now it's just absurdity. Just cause it was like that. It was like this was like had its absurdity, but had a grounding in something, and then we watched Just Cause Four trailer. It's like no, and now we're strapping balloons to cars and flying blood. It's like there's no narrative contextual framing to make the things that are absurd feel actually absurd if everything is absurd nothing is absurd like that's yes. how absurdity works well saints row ran into that brick wall yeah, that right? is yeah that's the the main one is like yeah. saints row did that that's also exactly how crackdown 3 looks to me of like crackdown yes. 1 again there's a lot of silly shit that happens in that game but it has a core like seriousness to it that makes the wacky shit feel cool and well, wacky well this is why i think sony took 10 years off god of war and yes. rebooted it, so we didn't have God of War 6, where he is, like, strapping a balloon to Greek gods and, like, sending them into space. Yeah, where they start making the video game specifically for, like, the weird dude bro who, like, they'll just, like, look at, like, the blades well, of chaos and it cuts everybody up and make, there's ridiculous giant things. Making the game for the meme. Yes, right? exactly. That's kind of what Just Cause 4's demo felt like. Like, this just, I don't even understand what game you're making anymore because it is just stupid. And if, if all it is is stupid, it's not interesting. I it want that. Something. I want that on the Game of the Year edition of Just Cause Four. It will never win Game of the Year, but it would be there, and it would be Sean Channel Weekly Stuff Podcast. More like just stupid. stupid. Yeah, that's that is what it is. Moving on, something else that was very stupid, but also just one of the weirdest things that has happened this E3 is a completely contextless trailer for something called that the end you found out called The Quiet Man. Which was, it was an FMV video of a dude walking down the street who turns into an alley and encounters racial stereotypes of, of some Latino young men and then beats them up when it yes. turns into a video game. Yeah, let's just be clear. What this was, was a white guy walks down an alley, finds three Latino guys minding their own business, they do nothing bad, and then he murders them all. Yeah, they're like, hey man, what's up? They're like, in a way that maybe could be interpreted as mildly threatening, and then he slaps the shit out of them and then like... Drops his lunch bag on someone's head. It's like, why? Yes. What? And this was one of two very racist trailers we got today. And I... Not at Eaton Square. The other one was at yeah. Ubisoft. And I tweeted that. Like, that was a really racist trailer. And I had... You know what, Sean? Someone come back with an MS-13 comment. Okay. So, so yes. The uh, the internet is and America is crazy. Yeah. No, this was just... I don't know what the... Because they didn't even put the developer on it. And I no, had to, I did some digging and found out the developer is a human head, I believe, who they made the original Prey game. And they oh. have been kind of wayward since then because they were making Prey 2, the old Prey 2, that then got canceled and then got rebooted as the new Prey game by Arcane that came out last year. So, like, that developer has made games that people like, but this, this trailer was just so absurd. I... Don't actually. I think I have a tweet from Wario sixty four that I can't. I can't source this. This is like every time I tried to find, kind of find out where Wario sixty four got this from, it just went back to his own tweet. So don't take this as like the gospel on this game. But it's the only information I could possibly find. So I'm just going to read this tweet. The Quiet Man delivers an immersive story driven cinematic action experience seamlessly blending high production live action realistic CG and pulse pounding action gameplay. Embark on an adrenaline fueled motion picture like experience which can be completed in one sitting. Nice. So that I guess is what The Quiet Man is. I don't know. I'm I'm not that interested. Yeah, I don't need any more video games or movies now. Fuck off. Let a video game be a video game. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. Moving on. We got, I think this is, this is the last thing they showed, was the second trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3. 
which was mostly just the Microsoft trailer, but Ratatouille, or Remy yeah. from Ratatouille was now in his head, and there was a long digression about Roxas and AI and a computer world that made... Uh, sure, yes. there was a, The best part about the trailer was, before the trailer started, Keith David said a couple of sentences, and one of them being, for every question, there is an answer. It's like, that. I don't like that Square Enix made Keith David lie to me. Because that's not fucking true. There is not an answer for every question that anybody could ever possibly about Kingdom Hearts 3. But yes, it was mostly footage from the the Microsoft trailer recut um, with some new stuff like Ratatouille in there. Uh, They ended with some of those utterly fucking incomprehensible plot spew garbage I've ever heard from anything to the point where it didn't sound like people were speaking English anymore even though I know that they were. I know, it's what's wonderful about it. Yes, so it's, Rox uh, is my heart, these in my heart, and somebody's gone the least. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's it. That's that's all they have to show. Square Enix. Oh, we're already done. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh-huh. Well, uh, let's save Kingdom Hearts 3 talk more for Sony, because they had an actual new trailer. <laughs> um, they had more new footage. Although it is interesting, like, Kingdom Hearts... I, I guess I should have guessed this, given, like, that it's on all the platforms, and it's kind of cross-generational and all this, but, like... Kingdom Hearts 3 weirdly has become like the game of E3 in that it's everywhere. Yeah. And it got its release date and had its own concert and everyone's talking about it. I did find it funny that Square Enix thought they, they were self-aware enough to know this is our big game, let's end with Kingdom Hearts. Not self-aware enough to cut a new trailer for it. And also, right after this, they announced online all the cool collector's editions. Mm-hmm. Why not put that in the show? Like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not mad. I don't need to be sold shit. But like, it would just feel like something you could put there to make it feel new. And also, the, the collector's edition for Kingdom Hearts 3 that is exclusive to the Square Enix store is $230. Fuck. More than the price of an Xbox One S. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't know why Square Enix showed up. I don't know what they were doing. No. It was a worthless show. There was nothing to it. I Because here's the thing. If they had just, like, randomly today started streaming and done that, no one would care. It would just be like, okay, here's a collection of Square Enix stuff, right? Yeah. And people might even find some of the little surprises cool. But because they, like, hyped it for weeks, it's like, we're coming back. They positioned themselves as one of, like, the big six this year. Yeah, and they, because they had a pretty decent one of these a couple of years ago where they showed more stuff. Like, that's where they debuted near Automata. Like, there was stuff in that press conference they did, like, two or three years ago. Yeah, so this was bizarre. They also had, as you say, all this other stuff yeah. that they could have talked about. So we saw no Dragon Quest Builders 2, which is right. a game that is announced that we know that they are making. And that one's also imminent. Like, it's yes. coming in the next year. It will be out probably by the next E3. Yeah, so either either they have lied to people and that video game doesn't actually exist, or they just decided randomly not to show it. I also know. a very popular game over here. So, uh-huh. yeah. yeah, so it's, there was more than enough space yes. to show that, you know? Um there also did not show any of the Final Fantasy VII remake, which there was nowhere at this E3 at all. Which what's makes the me feel last like it time? Exist. What's the last time we saw that? Oh, it's been I think at least two years. Yeah, because it was announced at the same show as Shenmue. Yes, on the Sony stage back when Sony showed other people's yeah, games. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was 2015. Yeah, so yeah. it's been a while. I don't know if it doesn't exist. I will say this: it's being directed by um, what's Kingdom Hearts guy uh, Tetsuya Nomura Tetsuya Nomura I forget his name every time it is also directed by Tetsuya Nomura he's also obviously directing Kingdom Hearts 3 I do wonder if they just hit a pause button on it until he's mm. done with Kingdom Hearts 3 and then he's going to go back to it because that's actually where Kingdom Hearts 3 was for many years when he was directing Final Fantasy 15 and then someone finally realized we can't do both of these at the same time yes um, if we are a large video game company we can get two project leads yes. <laughs> we can so, scrounge those up so that's when Hajime Tabata took uh, Final Fantasy XV for its last year of development, and then Nomura went over to Kingdom Hearts three, and then in that same time was when the announcement of Final Fantasy VII Remake happened. Nomura was talking about it a lot for like a year, and then it's been radio silence. So I don't know if the project was canceled, although that's certainly possible. But I do wonder if it's just like all hands on deck for the, obviously what is a very ambitious Kingdom Hearts three. Yeah, what, something important to note for that Final Fantasy VII Remake stuff is this is the one. The so far in the show, the, the jury is out on a couple of these because there's still time. But this is the one blow we have confirmed that no Final Fantasy VII remake. That's the one game that was on that Canadian Walmart leak that we have uh-huh. not seen any anything of that. Like 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 the space for that has gone. 
Like, uh, it, unless it's now a Switch exclusive. Yes, unless they have decided to say, like, oh, fuck it, we were making this game for PS4 and PC, let's make it for the Switch. Yes. Uh, yeah, then the other thing is, and this is actually a game I forgot that they were making that was announced, like, two years ago, so I forgot to bring it up in the predictions, but Crystal Dynamics is working on an Avengers game. Yes, I thought we might see that, but we did not. Yeah, so that was also completely... And we haven't heard anything about that game for, like, two years. Which yeah. I believe the, like, old Tomb Raider team is working on that, and, like, Idos Montreal or someone is working on... Yeah, Shadow of the Tomb, Tomb Raider is Raider. not... It's, it's Crystal Dynamics is listed, because I think people worked with them on it. But, yeah, Idos Montreal took Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so it's a completely different team. And the team that did Tomb Raider is doing Avengers. I don't think there's any, th- any problem with that game. It's probably very ambitious, and they've just been working on it. Um, I mean, if you think about it, like, you know, when we first saw Spider-Man, that was three years out from when Spider-Man yeah. was actually going to come out. And, you know, maybe Square Enix is just playing this one closer to the vest. But if you're going to do that, then you do not, not have do this it. video. Like, yes. there's no reason to have this video if you're not going to announce some things that are going to come out a little bit in the future. Yeah. Another thing I thought, like, kind of last note on the Square Enix thing that I thought was kind of interesting just in sort of juxtaposition with the Microsoft stuff is that there were a couple of games, like I think The Quiet Man and definitely, um, what's the fucking platinum one? Where was that? Babylon's Fall. Those two for sure, and then pretty sure Dragon Quest Eleven. those are not coming out on Xbox One. Oh, interesting. So, like, they was just, they had logos for PS4 and, like, Steam, and that was it. And, and so that's just something of, like, the Microsoft play for, like, Japanese developers seems to not, like, like they're still playing catch-up is what it feels like if... You know, specifically with Babylon's Fall, if that is not immediately coming out with a PS4 and Xbox One logo on that trailer, right? That's that's says something about like how far they've managed to go with that initiative. Yeah. Well, and honestly, we're going to see more of that because uh, you know it's it's extra work, and there's a certain point on the spreadsheet where you're not going to get enough sales to make it worth the work. Yeah. So. All right, that, that's, that's Square Enix. All right, Square that's, Enix. I, th- I think we talked about it longer than their fucking press conference. We did, so let's move on. Yeah, so next up, we've got a, a much bigger, although not many more new games, but still much bigger uh, press conference out from Ubiquitous Software. Yes, but it was fun. It was fun. It was fun. It was, it was, it, that's new games, whatever. It was fun. It had energy. Well, you know, like the point of the D3 press conference is to, you know, display the strength of your platform, not to just have a good time. Like, I, I, like, I, I want to so. have both. I want to have both, but I mean, Sony didn't show new games, really. But they showed like in-depth looks at yes, games yes. that exist, not a like very pie in the sky look at Beyond Good and Evil Two with a weird, weird other stuff. Like Except that was a really good. And show. then also them talking like about the multiple games that already are have been out for a while. Like, yeah, like no, it was uh, look, it was six. it was too long. This should have been yeah. at max an hour. It was ninety minutes. A bunch of it went on way too long. There was a section in the middle that was just in the exact same order, in the exact same way, multiple things they talked about at the last E3, Uh and that was kind of annoying. But I also thought, like, this had two or three of my favorite moments at E3 so far. So, you know, I grade on a curve. Yeah, for me, as someone who, like, plays quite a... Usually plays quite a bit of Ubisoft games, I felt like they didn't show anything other than Assassin's Creed that really interested me. You really really want that Watch Dogs 3, don't you? I really want a new Splinter Cell game because okay. it's been a long fucking. It's been like five years. It's like make a new. And that that was the other one. That is the other Canadian Walmart leak. No fucking Splinter Cell, and obviously it's not going to be anywhere else. Yeah, that's uh, like, unless Nintendo Switch exclusive. Well, then that would be that would be a very weird move. As we saw today, Ubisoft really loves Nintendo. <laughs> they have they're cozying up real close with yeah. Nintendo. They get Miyamoto to fly the fuck out for this shit. I, the, Miyamoto was already here. Probably, He's here probably. for Nintendo. He's yes, not here I know, for Ubisoft. I know. Yeah. Um, uh, so, anyways, let's, let's go through a little bit of their press conference. First note, significant note: Aisha Tyler is not back, which means I don't think she's going to be out in the Ubisoft stage anymore. This is two years in a row, and that makes me sad. Maybe um, she's got bigger and better things going on. You know, it's, maybe she's just like, you're not announcing fucking Splinter Cell that I'm not showing up, assholes. Like, <laughs> what do you, you want me up here talking about fucking CG trailer and like the Vision Two for five hours? No way. Um, I, I like the idea of, because that probably wouldn't be an actual conversation with Aisha Tyler, it would be her agent, and I yeah. like her agent having to relay that message to, like, another like, Yeah, scene. there's there's a post-it note on her, like, computer screen written by Aisha Tyler, this is like, no Splinter Cell, no deal. Yeah, and he's like, um, my client, Miss Tyler, uh, she has some feelings that um, there's not enough of a video game by the name of, let me see here, Splintered Cell, yeah. and uh, if you were to show that, she would be more amenable to showing up on your E3 press conference. 
Yeah. Anyway, but it started with something even better, I think, which was a dancing panda! No, it started with a very... And this is maybe one of the reasons why I feel a bit down on the Ubisoft press conference, is that it actually started with a very bad joke about, like, the keychain link... A leak from the, the Assassin's Creed thing, and the dude is like, "Ah, oh, it's the keychain joke." And I was like, "Pete Hines did a much better version of this last night." Oh, I missed that. Yeah, it was. It was like it might have technically been like the very end of the pre-show or okay. something. But yes, so that it put a sour taste in my mouth to not see Aisha Tyler and to make a bad keychain joke. Okay, but then can I just talk about the dancing panda? Yes, I the, really the dancing panda again. Yeah, the dancing panda and the whole like dance. It was so fun. They went around. They had the, like the the, sh- the film part, and then the dancing panda came in the theater, and they were dancing on stage and in the aisles, and it was really fun. And they didn't show a lick of footage for Just Dance 2019 because they don't have to. What I mean, th- what footage is there for Just Dance 2019? It's like a fucking UI and someone shaking their phone around or something. I don't yes. even know what those games are anymore. I know, but it was really fun. And then we also learned that Just Dance 2019 of all the systems it's coming to is also coming to the original Wii. Well, they didn't say it this year because this year was the year they learned that nobody's going to say a fucking word about this video game at all because there's no point in it. But in the past couple of years when they have revealed their new Just Dance game, they say the phrase and it is coming to every platform. Yes. And it's like when they say that, they basically mean that. You know, that's they should have, if, if Bethesda did get ahead of them, both in like the, the leak joke. Yep. And in this the 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 port joke, they should have made a fucking video with Keegan Michael Key about how just, just Dance is on Alexa, and it's yes. like I want to shake my hips to the right, okay, or whatever, <laughs> you know. That's- but yes, anyway, uh, yeah, I've only ever played Just Dance once. It was a Wii version at a friend's house, and I think it was Katy Perry's California Girls, and it was not very interesting. And, like, yeah. I'm honestly not entirely convinced that these Just Dance video games even exist anymore, just because of the way that this is shown. Is it this, like, if you didn't look at the logo in the background, you would have never known that it was Just Dance, because nobody said anything, nobody showed anything from the game. Like, like I say here in my notes, um, this is just like an acid trip sequence from, like, a movie or something. All they need to do is intercut cut clips of Leonardo DiCaprio looking sweaty and dazed. And it would just, if you just, like, you could do that. Go to, like, like Wolf of Wall Street or something and just cut together. This is just an acid trip. Maybe, there are cocaine, like, maybe that's the next it. E3 video I have to make. If I have some free time tomorrow, I can do that for you too, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. It, they did at one point do a, like, zoom cut into a lady's midriff, which was very that weird. That was, like, weird. right into her belly button was like that's a weird way yeah. to do that um but i liked the dancing panda i like the dancing fun, panda and i just generally like that i like the theme of big musical numbers this year at e3 yes there it's quite been a few. one of my favorite things and that was a big fun musical number and do i have any interest in the game attached to it <laughs> no but hey but it sets a fun tone for like the ubisoft always has a very fun kind of like quirky tone yes. on their e3 press conferences that i enjoy it is, it's similar to like watching the Bethesda press conference where Bethesda had the super laid back, like we're just hanging out, shooting the shit about these video games feel. And it's like, here's a platform for Todd Howard to like practice his stand up routine. It's like, that's great. I'll fucking show up for that. Um, and this is kind of like that, but it's more French. So it's yes. got like this weird quirk to it. And the one thing I was disappointed by, they, they have done the panda suit thing before. So I knew that they weren't going to do this. I desperately wanted whoever was in that panda suit to take off the head and it, to be like Eve Gima, the CEO of Ubisoft, or like Shigeru Miyamoto, or somebody important. I be don't like, think they can like, dance oh like that. Oh my god. It would be like that scene in Solo Star Wars Story, but actually what that scene should have been. You know, it's like, take off the helmet, dramatic reveal, everybody gasps, and it's like, oh my god, Star Fox is the panda. <laughs> That would have been great. It was another mascot suit under the <laughs> yeah. mascot suit. And yeah. the person inside under all that is dead. They yes. died from heat stroke. <laughs> I really think... I just think all the E3 shows could use more dancing pandas. I think, you know, the Sony thing tonight with uh, Gustavo Santolala was beautiful. <laughs> but if a tape panda had been dancing next to him while he very moodily played the guitar, it would have been even better. It was, it was technically a banjo. Banjo, uh, yes. But the, I mean, yes, no, the dancing panda from Ubisoft stage should have just crashed the other E3 press conference. <laughs> Imagine, like, that Rage 2 rock number was pretty good, uh-huh. but what if there had been a dancing panda just shredding? And fuck, and yeah, and Andrew WK would have just flowed with his, like, yeah. I don't know who the fuck this dude is, but he's ready to party. Yes. Like, that's why, instead of the cyberpunk, like, thing at the end of the Microsoft press conference, like, oh, like, cyberpunks have hacked our press conference. It's like, Dancing Pandas have hacked our press conference. And Dancing Panda comes up on stage, fucking throws Phil Spencer off the stage, like, this is my stage, now I'm going to dance. <laughs> yes, I think it'd be great. 
Anyways, anyway. that is that is more than any human being has talked in any relation to Just Dance 2019 ever so far. So yes. congratulations to us for, getting, for doing that. We should be in the fucking Guinness World Book of Records. We should. <laughs> Next up was a, a CG trailer for Beyond Good and Evil 2 that looks really good. It's a fucking... I, it's almost like the Beyond Good and Evil 2 stuff is in a similar place with Death Stranding for me. Of I don't really want them to make a video game. I just want them to make, like... CG short movies about in this like universe. Well, and here's the thing though, I loved that cinematic trailer. Yeah, I thought it, it was, was amazing. Awesome. I thought the writing was great, the voice acting was great, beautiful world. But then you know the devs came out and talked about it a little bit, which was cool. And then they showed a little bit of like as they said, very early pre-alpha game footage, and like just that little hint of actually playing in that world they built looked so cool with like the jumping around on the different flying vehicles and stuff. That, you know, who knows? This game could be coming out in 2025. I don't know. Or never coming out. Or never Which coming out. Very distinct possibility. But, uh, I, I loved the look out of it. This one really captured me. Cause I don't, I, I had to look up what was Beyond Good and Evil 1. I'm like, oh, I, it was on the GameCube. It was a long like, time ago. Like, I have not played Beyond Good and Evil 1, but I kind of thought I understood what Beyond Good and Evil was. And then I watched this trailer. It's like, because they do this dramatic reveal, because it's supposed to be a prequel, and they do a dramatic reveal at the end of the trailer where Jade, the main character from the first game, shows up with the sword, and it's like, I thought she was like a Lois Lane kind of photojournalist, and I looked at it and was like, yeah, that's what she, was she a space assassin before that? Like, it makes me want to play Beyond Good and Evil 1 to find out if there's like some weird part of that game yes. I just completely did not understand happened. I did spend some time today seeing if there was a way I could play that game easily today. It's on Steam. It's on Steam? Yeah. Okay. I don't have a PC, so, yes. but yeah. So I, cause I did the same thing. Yes. Yeah. I do, I, it's, yeah. it's on Xbox, but they haven't added it to Xbox 360 backwards compat. I uh, bet they will. That yeah. seems like an easy, not easy, but like an obvious choice. But what yeah. I was going to say is that, Either way, you don't know about the first one. This one looks very cool to me. I love the look of it. it I said this. It looks like a playable Luc Besson movie. Like sure, the Fifth I Element that, or yeah. that Valerian movie he did last year. Neither of which I've seen in full because they don't look like cohesive movies I would actually enjoy. They're not. They look like something I would love to go play and exist in. So I'm actually psyched for this. I think it's a yeah. little bizarre that this was their opening game after Just Dance 2019 when, again... No, nothing on the horizon. This, this is probably, if it comes out this generation, it'll be very late. Um, uh, but it is kind of cool to see Ubisoft is clearly like psyched for this thing. They're not even burying it. I mean, but it is the kind of thing in like, kind of like with Anthem, but even more extreme of, I just don't really know what the game is. And it feels like they don't know what the game is. Yeah, but they're also not telling us it's coming out in six months. So that's, that's true. The but, but still like it's, but it's impossible for me to get excited about a game that I have no idea what it is. I mean, like, I'm excited about your CG trailer. It seems pretty clear. It's like a story based game and you go play in the city. Is and it? Like... Because the last time they talked about this game, it was a giant sandbox, like No Man's Sky style pitch. Oh, it was? Okay. Yeah. Like, I don't think you know what this game is because they don't okay. know. Okay. The game is. Yeah, okay, that's because weird. the next thing that happened was Joseph Gordon Levitt came out on stage. Right. I missed some of this, so you're gonna have to fill me in. Okay. There were things going on. And this I... is actually maybe the thing that makes me the most down on Beyond Good and Evil 2, because I think it's kind of sketchy what happens. So okay. Joseph Gordon Levitt comes in. Did you see that Joseph Gordon Levitt came out on stage? I saw the tail end. I was like, I had to go out of the room for a minute, come back in. It's all live, obviously. And I'm like, why was Joseph Gordon Levitt there? And I was confused. So apparently, Joseph Gordon Levitt is the like founder, co founder of a company called Hit Record that yes. does some sort of collaborative art thing. Um, and so what they are doing is it seems that they are. You can frame this in a lot of ways that make it sound, like, super positive and cool or, like, very negative and exploitative. I kind of feel that it sounds kind of exploitative to me of they're sort of outsourcing a lot of the, like, bulk production, like, asset generation stuff for this game to the fan community of that basically what you can do, it seems, is you can, like, create music, create, like, art, like, textures, character models, that kind of stuff. And submit them somehow through this hit record thing. I don't understand how any of this shit works. Yeah. Because it was not explained in any, like, in-depth way. And it's a complicated concept. And it, it's something of where eventually it sort of came out that you would be paid for it if you if your work that you did was picked. And they have $50,000 in total to distribute across the fan community for a game that uh, the one, one Patrick Klepek, video game, noted video game journalist on Twitter, then made a very good tweet in response to that tweet that announced that of, like, Ubisoft made $2 billion last year. Yeah. This is 50000 for Beyond Good and Evil 2, which, you know, they spent more than $50,000 making that fucking CG trailer, you know? Yes. Like, that's... 
no money and the way that you're pitching this like like hey guys you all love beyond good and evil 2 and we can all make beyond good and evil 2 together this video game that ubisoft if it comes out is going to make literally millions of dollars off of and you will get like five bucks for your like like actual labor that you produced that is like video game design work that we hire people to do that have salaried positions but we're going to undercut them and like outsource the shit to you is like that's fucked up it's very scummy it's weird because there are ways I could imagine that being cool if it was just like, if you want to submit fan art, we'll put it in the game and like the bars and stuff. Sure, yeah. That would be, no one would have a problem with that. That would yeah, be a different thing. Frame it in the right way and it's like a contest and like there's like yeah. clear terms and you like, because the kind of thing of it is is that you're asking people to make like generate labor for you that they then submit to you and then you decide whether or not you pay them for it after yeah. they've always, like it's something fucked up it's weird like there are a lot of people um in the game community that know a lot more about this shit than i do that you can go find like austin walker or scott benson who's a developer has a good thread on twitter about it um it's just weird i don't know it's complicated so it might not be as bad as it seemed but it's very hard to tell and there's just something fucking weird about let's put a big movie star on the stage and say hey guys make stuff for our video game and then just leave it's like I don't know like again it sounds like you don't even understand what video game you're making when you're asking everybody else to make it for you very strange he see if I think if I had seen that I think I would have not been as excited about this part of the show yeah so I I very conveniently walked out at a good moment yes you, they, they, they pitched it well for you this was also the first instance of a what is for me as someone who has like social anxiety a, a, a terrible horrible like gaff that they had of that they just didn't know when to fucking cut the mics of the people that were on the stage yes and so when one of the people walked off I think it was uh, Gabriel Schrager the narrative director you could hear say we nailed it we nailed it. And it was like, that was fine. There were a couple of other ones, because it's like, oh, that's cool, because it's like, she's enthusiastic, yes. very happy about it. There are a couple of other ones that's like, this is so awkward, and how, this is fucking E3, you've done this for like 20 plus years, how do you not know when to cut the fucking mics, what yes. is going on? Do you need I, to outsource that job to somebody else, so they can cut the mics for you? Justin Gordon-Levitt comes back midway through this through, through this show to be like, hey, I've got some people who could do this on the, on the web community, yes. cut your mics. Yeah. Fifty thousand dollars for mic cutters. What what have, would have been great is after George Joseph Gordon Levitt walks off stage, you just hear be like, "Those suckers, they bought it again." It's like, <laughs> oh no. Anyway. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that's I I recommend people to sort of dig in more to that weird uh, hit record stuff because it's, uh, it's interesting. It's I weird. have to say, one of my favorite tweets from today. I forget who this was. I think it was Heather Alexandria from Kotaku mm-hmm. had a tweet that was, that part would have been way better if Joseph Gordon-Levitt had just used his Philip Petit voice from the uh, Man on Wire movie. Uh-huh, yeah. And that is absolutely true. It was like the weird accent, the French accent. French yeah. accent, yes. Which, he's on the Ubisoft stage. Why yes. not? Yeah. They should, they should have just had him be on a wire, like, above the stage. Like, that's yeah. how, like, I could see Ubisoft doing that if if he was up for it. Yeah. If old Joe was up for it. Uh, so that's that's Beyond Good and Evil 2. Next up, they talked about Rainbow Six Siege for a while, which is a video game that has been out for like three years. Um, it has 35 million players, apparently, which is a lot of people. Like, I knew that this game had been very successful with like the post-launch support, uh, but I did not realize that, they, that it was that successful. And they talked about esports. Do you have Do anything you... to say about Rainbow Six Siege, Jonathan? I don't. I did think their little esports section was much better than, say, the oh, one yes. at EA. Oh, God, like, yeah. I, it's not something I'm personally into, but the little, like, documentary footage they showed was like, okay, that's cool. That's the kind of stuff, like, if you're going to highlight esports that is interesting to me. Yeah, and... because they specifically said that they are making a documentary about, like, the Rainbow Six esports scene called Another Mindset. That like, yeah. So they're, like, actually making a documentary about it, which is cool. And yes. that seems to me, like... It felt to me like, oh shit, right, that's like one of the things that esports really desperately needs, is it needs that kind of like some good documentaries, and it needs like, esports will be a thing once they have a really good, feel good sports movie that comes out during the summer (laughs) that is all about esports athletes, like, in the way that you have like all those fucking sports movies from like the 70s and 80s and shit that did that, like, that's what esports needs, and and then esports will have hit the main culture. Yes, and you know who the person in that movie will be? Who? Mr. Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Exactly, yes, of course, where he, yes. he outsources his, his esports team on hit record and some of young up-and-coming, you know, kid was, on the streets. I was going to say he would play the real-life kid on the he's, streets. He's too old. He's, he's aged out Sean. of esports. You are in Hollywood, are you ever... 
But you're, you're too old for esports once you're like 22 years old. Okay, you, that's your, true. your reflexes have aged out already. It okay. is brutal. It, it is, is brutal on the streets of esports. All right. Um, next up was probably my favorite part of the Ubisoft stage, even if I'm not that interested in the game, was when uh, Antti Iveso, I don't even know how to pronounce the name, the creative director um, on the next Trials game. This was so great. He's been on the stage a couple of times. He basically is the guy who's always on stage for a Trials game. He came out in like an evil Knievel looking suit on a motorcycle and just drove up to the stage. I was. An, they didn't have any ramps, so it obviously was not feasible. I wish that he could have just driven the motorcycle onto the stage and, like, flipped the bird to the Forza people, because all they ever do is, like, fucking spin cars around. It's just like, he drove it on stage. That's what you all should have done, because it would be really cool. He didn't quite go that far. What he did do was a staged pratfall into a, like, desk with a computer on it that, like, collapsed in, you know, movie fashion. And I, I, it was very funny and very weird. I don't really understand why he did it, but I liked it. It was very funny. It was very weird. I loved it. I loved it. Then when he started talking, the just energy he had for yes. Trials, which I've never played Trials. I love the energy he had. I actually really enjoyed the silly trailer they showed. I like that it's finally come to Nintendo Switch with yep. the other platforms. Switch port. Maybe I'll try this one. It, it looked fun. Trials um, is fun. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Uh, trials Fusion just came out on PS Plus, so maybe I'll give it a go. But uh, I just, it looked, they, they had definitely... The tone of, like, the guy's presentation was so perfectly matched with the game. Yeah. It very much went together for me. And there was, like, no pretension about it. It was just, you know, fat guy on a motorcycle. And it was great. And I can say that. It was fun. Yeah. Fat guy. It was fun. I enjoyed it. You know, moment of pride. Yeah. One thing they did talk about that I thought was an interesting idea is that they, like, hired and brought people into their company from the community to, like, design their tutorial and stuff. Oh, which is an interesting idea. There's some the guy whose YouTube handle is Professor Fat Shady, which is a good good there YouTube go. handle. Um, and the, and apparently, like he came up in the community making these videos explaining like high level trials techniques. And so they hired him to make the tutorial for this game. That's something that like fighting games desperately need to do because most fighting games have like really like low level like very basic tutorials. And there are so many great resources online where, like, everything I learned how to play Dragon Ball Fighters was 100% shit I found yep. outside of the game online. And getting someone like that from the community that knows how to explain this stuff to make stuff for the game, that's a cool idea that I hope other companies do. And again, like, they're actually hiring them and, and giving them, like, salary positions and making right. them employees. They're not just sort of, like, asking them to do this labor for free. They didn't good. They didn't take their YouTube link and download it and then put it in the game or something? <laughs> yeah, they'd just be like, you should be happy that you're in our game. You're a part of our fan community. Why should we need to pay you? It's like, you're, we're all big, happy families. It's like, fuck you guys. This capitalism sucks. <laughs> Next up, we had, again, a, a game about uh, capitalism sucking, but also capitalism being the only way to survive, The Division 2. That trailer was hella racist. It's it's bad. Yeah. It was... It was all women, mostly black women, yeah. screaming and crying on the ground and being brutalized and executed by white soldiers. Um, it was fuck a, that trailer. It was fuck a it. long fucking trailer, too. Yeah. It just went on and on. It was like four or five minutes long, and it, I kept on trying to figure out... Why is this trailer so long? I and think it's because it was like one big like one take thing, which isn't wasn't impressive in any way. No, it's terrible. Like, and why then is the, it so fucking long? And then the game director came out and did a full on Senate filibuster yeah. on the floor of the Ubisoft show. This was the worst part of the Ubisoft show. It went on forever. Because yeah. it, it, it would have been bad anyways, just because of my distaste for the division. But it is like ex- exponentially worse when we just it's the same thing. As Square Enix, like we just saw this, and the division two had a huge thing on the Microsoft stage, and this was. Like, they maybe spent more time on it here, although, like, not anywhere near as much, like, actual gameplay footage. It's right. just, like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, let's see, anything else that was... They, there was a line that I thought was weird of them saying, if you fail, history will be built by tyrants. Washington, they also said, Washington, D.C. must prepare for the greatest threat it has ever encountered. This is just like, mm, we're already, we're in the middle of this, my friend. Like, it feels like... The, you can put the Division Two on like the same stack as like Far Cry Five of games yeah. that were not meant to come out in the Trump era, and very unfortunately did because it makes their games look fucking tone deaf and awful. And it would have been bad anyways. It's way worse in like yes. the context it, it's released in now. It is the opposite. It is like the negative version of the Wolfenstein Two effect. It's like a mathematical equation that can be made. Yeah, yeah. Division Two, gross. Very Moving gross. on. Something something that was very pleasant. There's there's a bit of a whiplash thing going on a bit in the Ubisoft here. Um, they had the Mario and Rabbit section where Grant Kirkhope came out on stage and did the like Sony we're gonna just like live orchestrate the trailer for our video game. And this it was, was very cool. This is my favorite part of E3, and I want to yeah. talk about it. Maybe okay. not at completely because Sony had some really good demos, but like in terms of just 
one little video game trailer, this is my favorite one of E3 so far. Like, not a giant demo, but just a right, trailer. Yeah. Because, one, the trailer for that little, that D, it's a DLC, but it's basically a full extra campaign kind of thing. Right. Is so charming. I love all the in jokes they have in there about Donkey Kong. The way they've put the rabbits in there. You now have rabid Cranky Kong, which is great. And just, like, especially also a year out of, like, last year we watched all the Mario and Rabbit stuff being like, that looks surprisingly good, but let's wait and see, because it was such a weird idea. And this year we've all played Mario plus Rabbids, and it's a fantastic game. One of the best Mario RPGs. And all the Rabbit stuff was very charming and funny in that universe. And so I'm watching this just being like, God, I love that game. I can't wait to play more of it. I love how they're leaning into the Donkey Kong of it all. And on top of that, you had Mr. Grant fucking Kirkhope yep. up there leading a live band slash little like string quartet kind of thing um, over it with uh, both original music of his own for this game, some of his Donkey Kong 64 music, some Donkey Kong Country music, all together in this suite over the trailer. That was just such a purely joyous moment, also combined with a game I am very excited to play, that it was just a, a kind of slam dunk moment for E3 for me. Very fun. Yeah, it was it was slightly undercut that be, right before that happened, the guy uh, who was an executive producer on the game, Xavier Manzanares, who kind of did, like introduced this segment, he walked off stage to make room for Grant Kirkhope and everybody. And this is where we got the, again the mic thing of someone saying, "I'm so sorry that we changed your entrance right before the show." It's like, oh, it changes every day. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like, what? Dude, that's you're not supposed to hear that. That's not a fun one to hear. That's a very awkward one to hear. It's like. Again, it just like, it just stresses me out to hear that kind of stuff. It's like, I just imagined myself in that scenario and I would explode from embarrassment. But anyway, I love this. This is coming out June 26th. Yeah, so in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's, uh, I checked on the Nintendo shop. It's only a $14.99 DLC. It's pretty cheap. And the season pass is 20. And if you have that, you get this uh, a day early, actually. And again, they're adding like a whole island to the game, which there are four of those in the main game. So it's like a quarter the size of the main game, which for a DLC is pretty meaty. So yes. I'm excited. I and then when I was making my notes, I did make a Donkey Konga joke early in the notes, and then by the end, I noted there is actually a Donkey Konga attack apparently in Mario and Rabbids because you saw it for a brief yes. second, and so they made good on it, and and I'm I'm glad. Yeah, of course they were going to make a yes. Donkey Konga joke. Yes, I I do have to say one disappointment is that the Grant Kirkhope uh, band called Critical Hits only two of the members were wearing Donkey Kong ties. They should have all been wearing Donkey Kong ties. Okay. That's, that's, that's just a weird that's I get like it. a weird gap maybe they didn't have enough to go around that, that's what it kind of felt like to me yeah. maybe Shigeru Miyamoto only brought two Donkey Kong ties with him from Japan <laughs> yes and where like, they're, they are like hand manufactured <laughs> yeah yes. in, in Kyoto yeah yes um, moving on a section that I thought was was pretty strong a lot stronger than I was expecting was Skull and Bones had a a nice sort of CG trailer that was like really well put together. Really well put together because I didn't know this game was going to have any particular narrative content. Yeah, but it was like, oh, that's cool, like pirate ass pirate stuff. Well, what this presentation felt like to me, like combined with knowing that they have kind of like delayed the game for a year from its original projection, is if like if you remember the original demo and kind of like half pitch for the game, that was the pitch was a bit unclear. But it was way more sort of like multiplayer focused originally, right. and this showed a, there's still a lot of multiplayer stuff. But this one showed more like story context. It showed you at like the base, sort of like customizing your ship. It showed a pirate dude that you're obviously controlling, kind of like walking around in your base. And that was the kind of stuff that felt like the original pitch of the game maybe not would have not had that, and people were kind of clamoring for yes. something that was a bit like a bigger of a pirate experience. So I'm guessing that they kind of expanded the scope of what the game was going to be and yeah. delayed it. This looks like a game that was delayed because they decided to make more of it, not yes. because it had a troubled production. Uh-huh. It, it, honestly, it feels like maybe two years ago at E3, like they saw the positive reception and they're like, should we do more with this? And that's why it's taking forever. Yeah. Um, because I love this. I love like the tone, like the set, because I'm kind of a, I love naval-based novels. Right. Yeah. And this one is clearly set in like a, they even have the tagline, pirates, piracy is dead, long live piracy, yeah. of like a late piracy era sort of thing. Kind of reminded me of... Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. There's a Michael Crichton book called Pirate Latitudes. Hmm. It's one of the ones they published after he died. Like, it was a manuscript on his laptop that they found. But it's really great. I wish he would have published it. It's like one of his early books that they're shorter, non-political. But it's... um, it's like it's kind of like that. You're fight. It's a it's a mean little book that's like just it it is kind of like sharp and to the point, and it does have that same kind of feeling of like piracy has kind of gone underground a little more, and there's something very rough about it. Um, 
And I just, I love the tone of that. And then all the gameplay they showed was really cool and solid. Looked much more than just like a spinoff of Assassin's Creed 4. Yeah. And I did think the demo went on a little too long. But I did also... It's also like, it felt like part of the reason it felt like that to me was that the boat combat feels something that's a hard thing to make a like a trailer around. Because it's not as like sexy as... Like a first person shooter or something that's very fast paced. It's not easy as easy to cut around a trailer for this as is like a Rage 2. This is like a lot of like lining up your shot, getting on like the top, crushing that wave, and then firing all your cannons into sails and stuff. But it looks like it's going to play great. It looks good. Uh, And basically, I walked away from this uh, just saying to myself, this is what I wanted out of Sea of Thieves. Yeah, this is what I wrote in my notes is it's like Sea of Thieves, but a video game. Yes. Which was because it literally, like, kind of, it almost felt weirdly intentional of like, you kind of ran down the bullet points of everything they were doing. Of like, there's like shared world multiplayer, and like you're like sieging these forts, and then you're attacking other like things to get their loot, and then like fighting each other over the loot at the end. And it's kind of that sort of Kane and Lynchy. We are like making a like sort of dangerous alliance, and then once that like you know the gold is out in the open, then the alliance breaks down, and every it's every pirate for themselves. All that kind of stuff that is very much a part of the pitch of Sea of Thieves, but with an actual video game in there too, which yes. is a nice bonus. Yeah, it's a video game, not a Fisher Price toy. Yeah, um, this was also at the very beginning of this trailer. We had another mic weird thing happening where somebody like just you could hear on their mic backstage saying Brian, Brian. Which at first I thought that was because this is right before the trailer came up, so I thought that was like a part of the trailer, and then it was pirates. It's like I ain't never heard of no pirate named Brian. That's like a Star Wars character named Toby. <laughs> Callbacks. All right. Yeah. What was um, next? Next was somebody behind the Ubisoft stage saying, lights up. And then I wrote my notes, mics off, guys. Cut the mics. What are you doing? Um, but the, actually what was next was Elijah Wood came out on stage right. for the Transference game that is coming out uh, later this fall, which I think maybe is not just a VR game now. I was not very yes, clear. Yes, yeah. I saw that in a separate press release, but it's for all platforms, yeah. not just VR. Which, yeah. which is cool because I do not own a VR thing. And yeah, nobody people, does. Yeah, most people do not own a VR thing. You know um, who owns a VR thing? Journalists. Nobody else. I bet Nobody Elijah streamers. Wood has a PSVR at home because sure. he is helping make this video game, so they yes. must have given him one for free. I love Elijah Wood. He's I love so him charming. Here. He's I love so him charming. so much. Yeah. Yeah, he, I liked he had, like, a... He broke for a second when he was delivering the thing and had that great, like, look deadpan into the cameras. No. And then he went back to <laughs> yep. It's like... It, it, it's something of where, because I'm so familiar with Elijah Wood as an actor... He, he might have been pretending to do that, and I couldn't tell because he's a very talented actor. So very like, talented yeah. actor. And this looks like a cool, interesting video game. Yeah, it's got like a cool sort of horror vibe to it. It's like, you know, part FMV, part video game, but it's not, doesn't seem like it's racist like the other part FMV video game we saw, that quiet yeah. thing. Yeah, like I I don't know if I will play it, but I did not mind watching that, that demo, and I like seeing Elijah Wood because he's cool. Yes. More Elijah Wood. Next up was, I like this, so this is my. Journey over the course of this trailer, trying to remember what the title of this video game was, was at first I wrote, Starfall Rise of Atlantis? What the fuck is the title of this game again? Oh, right, Starlink Rise of, At- of Atlas. Oh, wait, no, it's Starlink Battle for Atlas, which I only, I only figured that part out at the very end. It went, because st- I actually think Starfall Rise of Atlantis is a better title than Starlink Battle for Atlas. I came it's, up with a better title for the game that is basically the title for the game. It's pretty good. Yeah, so this is their weird Toys to Life um, game that I kept on waiting for them to actually show what the video game looked like. Because, I mean, I think that they were showing in-engine, like, cutscene stuff, but they showed almost no gameplay. And then the the guy, the creative director, Lauren uh, Malville, kind of seemed like he was segueing into a gameplay thing. And then instead of segueing into a gameplay thing, they segued into Star Foxes in the game. It was like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. What was actually cool is that that Miyamoto is there. Although this felt a bit desperate by Ubisoft in that, like, they weren't making a... It, it's not Mario and Rabbids. You're not, like, collaborating with Nintendo making a full video game. Nintendo is allowing you to use one of their, like, very popular characters in your video game that nobody gives a shit about. And right. so it's like... It, there was something vaguely desperate about Eve Yimo, the CEO of Ubisoft, having to go out into the stands where Miyamoto is sitting and be like, hey, we, we brought you a gift, Miyamoto-san. <laughs> like, yes. I mean, you know, it's fucking Shigeru Miyamoto. He, he, he needs his, his taxes, you know, but... Yes. I did half expect Eve's 
to just like get on one knee and present it like yeah. above his head. <laughs> just like, as, like take yes. the, the top off and show yes. their like weird R wing thing. It also really felt like Miyamoto did not know that was going to happen. It did, yeah. Because he seemed very genuinely just kind of surprised and also like no one's translating for him. Yeah, because <laughs> it was it was actually my favorite part of the whole thing was Eve saying like so, do you like it? And then Miyamoto, you can kind of barely hear him because I'm not even sure if he was mic'd up or not. Right. And so you can hear him say in Japanese, Sugoi, yoku dekteru, which means like, this is awesome. It's really well made. Yes. And then the best part, the, the Miyamoto touch at the end is he says, Trebian. <laughs> yes. Like, that was great. He knows that Eve is, you know, French Canadian. He says, like, you're going to, like, say this for you, Eve, my friend. Not for the rest of, like, the English speaking audience watching this. Yeah. But just between you and me, I'm going to say this in French. Yeah. I have no interest in Star Killer lunch on. Atlantis or whatever Starlink, it's called. Starlink, Battle for Atlas. Yeah, no interest in that, but it was cool to see Star Fox. I was actually kind of zoning out during this trailer, and then Star Fox showed up, and I was like, what? The, what are they did, showing? Did I pass out for an entire day <laughs> and I'm not watching the, the Nintendo Direct? Direct? Right. Uh, but the Star Fox, and then, so that's kind of cool. I like seeing Miyamoto, and I do just like the Ubisoft Nintendo bromance. Yes. It is fun. I just wanted, like, Eve to very quietly just, like, put his hand over Miyamoto's and then just kind of, like, pull it away in embarrassment, you know? I just want that, like, I want, like, the romance to get a little bit more developed each E3 yes. until they just kiss on stage at the end. <laughs> It's they walk up onto the stage near the center as on the screen, Mario and I don't know, an Assassin's Creed dude walk up yeah. to each other and they just Mario both... in fucking I would actually love this Mario in Bayek from Assassin's Creed Origins. <laughs> yes. and, and Bayek just like wraps him up in his arms and finds a big old smooch on that plumber's hairy yes. head. Yes, right as Miyamoto and Eve do the same thing. Yes. It'd be great. It'd be it'd be very good. Yes. Um next up was another video game that has been out for like a year, For Honor. Right. What is this game? This is the video game where there are samurai peoples, and there are Viking peoples, and there are like medieval European knight peoples. Is it a free to play game? No. It okay. Is. You pay. You pay the money for, to play the video game. Okay. Game. Um. It has like it had a lukewarm sort of reception. I think maybe it's kind of like a Rainbow Six Siege thing of people have kind of warmed up to it after a lot of post-release support. Yeah. Honestly, the thing that's most interesting to me about For Honor is that there was a story that came out a while ago on Kotaku. I have it here because I kind of want to read a bit of it about the um, guy, God, what's his name? Vandenberg, who was the, the game director for the release of For Honor that is no longer with Ubisoft because he left on kind of bad terms at the end of that game's development. Yeah. And he was the guy, if you remember, when they were ever showing off For Honor, he would show, walk up on stage with like this big Gandalf beard and a cane right. and this awesome voice and you'd kind of like narrate what the game was. Um, and the reason why you didn't see that awesome dude on stage was because he's not with Ubisoft anymore. And there's actually a documentary being made that is being released, I think, like later this year about... Um, his like relationship developing this game and how it kind of fell apart in the last couple of months until it eventually led with him, like resulted in him leaving uh, Ubisoft entirely. I think he's still on like sub- I think he went on sabbatical and then he quit, which okay. is basically what happens uh, with 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 big video game people. But just like to give you a sense of the tone of this, this is from the, the Kotaku story by Ethan Gack. For Honor's creation ended with the behind-the-scenes breakup. The first paragraph is, The most interesting moment from a new documentary about the making of For Honor comes just over 70 minutes in when the team at Ubisoft Montreal is celebrating the game getting certified on Xbox One and PS4. Speeches have been made and the champagne is flowing freely when the game's then-creative director, Jason Vandenberg, turns to the studio CEO, Yanis Mallet, and says, You will forgive me if I don't dance on my own grave. Okay. And so, having read that story and being actually pretty interested in uh, the the documentary called "Playing Hard" that's coming out later, uh, I like I really want to watch the documentary because there's not a lot yes. of video game documentaries being made. Made it very hard to care about For Honor because it's like kind of fuck this game. I think it's, like. I think it's impossible to care about this game either way because I knew none of that and I just kind of glazed over for this whole segment. But yeah, uh, well, the that's one story. thing is. That they are making a... There's a DLC expansion called For Honor Catching Fire, which I normally wouldn't give a shit about, but they have to make a... They have a new fourth faction, which is a bunch of Chinese warriors that look like... They basically just have Guan Yu from Romance of the Three Kingdoms without it being Guan Yu from Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and that was like, I like Romance of the Three Kingdoms. I but that Guan Yu doesn't have a black beard, so he doesn't count. Yeah, there's enough Dynasty Warriors games for you, Sean. There is, and, and I'm, I'd be more interested in, in playing more Dynasty Warriors 8 than, than getting For Honor. Okay. The Crew 2 is a video game that's coming out in like two weeks, and there's an open beta on June 21st, which is like four days before that video. It's it's eight days, because the game is coming out on 29th. They are having an open beta eight days before the game is fully released. The beta term has been officially shot in the back of the head. 
I, I think that happened a long time ago. This is this, is, this when, is the most egregious one I've seen. Like, because usually it's like at least a month. At least it's like something you could kind of justify. Maybe they're tuning the network servers or something. This is like no. There's nothing you could do a, like a week before the game's coming out. I'm just saying. I think it's been dead for a while. This was maybe the maggot eating the last piece of flesh off its corpse. Sure, I could do but that, the yeah. word beta. Yeah in common parlance has come to be equivalent to the word demo. Like, that's just yeah. very clearly, that is how it is used. Future dictionaries will put them as, uh, in or thesauruses will put them as equivalent, because that's how we use them. It, it means nothing anymore. At the very beginning of this section, uh, you could hear the lady that came out to talk about the crew to say, ooh, nice, behind the stage. And See, again, what the fuck was that? Because it's not like, you know, if it happens one time at the beginning, it's unprofessional, but you can understand it. When it happens consistently, almost at the beginning and end of every single, like, section for the entire press conference, somebody's losing their fucking job. Yes. <laughs> and they probably should be. Um, were you, you must have been watching this with headphones or something, because I didn't hear any of this. I was, I, I am laser focused. Okay. I'm taking notes. I, I'm I, paying attention. I mean, I Red heard Bull it, car. but I could not make out any of the words. So, interesting. They had a Red Bull car in the Crew 2, and I okay. noticed that, and I put it in my notes. That's how laser-focused I am. Were you on Red Bull when you did these notes? I have never had any Red Bull in my life. I have not either. Seems, it seems gross. I don't it does like seem gross. Juice. All right. The last thing at the end of their press conference where they showed... Did they show any? They showed Trials Rising is the, and Just Dance 2019 are the only new video games they showed. <laughs> like, okay, they, they needed something else. Uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey counts just because and, we knew the title. Yeah, but like this game had been leaked like a month ago. It's that's just, it not like, there. But but they were yeah. not going to do that. This was that's, going to be yeah. a reveal. You can't put that on them. And and that, lots but of, that doesn't make but, their Assassin's Creed Odyssey thing exciting. <laughs> You know, I, I the guess way that that's, it might have that's been like complaining way. about Bethesda showing Fallout seventy six just because they put the title out there. It's yeah, the but then thing. but then they had their shit together that they had more stuff to show. I know? guess, but you know, I'm fine. I just I guess I felt like very. It's one of the reasons I just felt sort of disappointed by the end of this press conference is I just didn't come away excited for anything. Okay, and part of that is that they showed almost nothing new because yeah. if the only new video games you're showing are a fucking Assassin's Creed Odyssey and a trial sequel. Like, that's even, even, like, if Assassin's Creed didn't get leaked, you still needed more new stuff, right? I guess so. But let's talk about Odyssey. Yes, so Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it is basically what the leak was, although there was some, like, about the leak, there was a lot of competing information, and I'm glad that they have, like, it is set around 400 BC. I think I wrote the specific date. 431 BC. So it's actual ancient Greece. Yes, it's actual ancient Greece. It's around the Peloponnesian War. So it's like, this is the, they specifically shout it. It's like the Golden Age of Athens. So you have Socrates is in the demo they show. You know, you have Plato would be running around somewhere. Like, it's that sort of period. You know, that's where, like, a lot of the great plays were written and stuff in Athens. So it's that section. So it's like, it's properly ancient Greece. It's not 800 BC when, when the Odyssey was written. So, but I guess you know the word Odyssey presumably would have entered the the, the the language of Greece more broadly because obviously it comes from the name Odysseus. If you did not remember, yes, I do. I yeah. just not we're, we're getting a little off track here, but yeah, I like ancient Greek stuff, and they are like actually doing ancient Greece because if they had done what the original rumor was of it being very close to the Assassin's Creed origin setting time wise, that would have been a bad spot to do Greece. They're doing a good spot to do Greece. It is kind of confusing when you think about the fact that the Assassin's or like group has not been founded yet, and because that is what happens in Origins, and so I don't know what this has to do with Assassin's Creed at some point, yes. but like it's a better setting, and it maybe feels like they should have done their origin story earlier in the timeline. If they, yeah, if it's a little weird. This. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have a conflicted reaction to this, because so watching all the, the stuff they showed on stage... I just came away with a sense of, like, good God, that just looks like Origins. Like, yeah, like, the UI is literally the Assassin's Creed Origins UI. Down to the typeface and the yeah. color. Like, it is identical. The world looks identical because you go to Greece in Origins, and Greece is obviously very near Egypt yeah. on the planet Earth. And so there's a lot and of, And just, like, like there's same... a lot of cultural crossover because, yes. you know, because the Egypt you are in is currently being occupied, like... It's the end of that dynasty, but it is being ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty, yes. which is a, like of Greek origin. Yes. So, just looking at it, it was like, God, that just looks like Origins DLC or something. And and I don't think they did a good job selling maybe what makes the game different and special on stage because then when I went and like then they disembargoed a bunch of people who yeah. had like played the game and I read some of the different previews and like every journalist who looked at this game what came away very enthusiastic was that your experience? Yes, yeah. yeah and it, like honestly what it feels like is all the Bioware like dripped out of Anthem and yes. dripped onto Assassin's Creed because they're like romance options there's 
dialogue stuff. You can you don't get to make a fully custom character, but you can either pick Cassandra or the the female player character, or not pick Cassandra, which nobody's going to pick the other dude because he looks like a dick. He does. So yes, like you can you can pick male female. You can do romances completely gender fluid too. Yeah. They, they it's let you ancient romance. Greece. Like, yes. If it was not gender fluid, it would be a very poor historical representation. <laughs> yes. So you can romance any of the characters who are romanceable as either gender. Um, it will have the dialogue tree stuff. It'll have some of those other kind of RPG trappings like multiple endings and branching paths and things like that. And that's all very neat. They really only paid lip service to it on stage saying, this is an RPG, and to prove it, here's a dialogue tree. It's like, okay. And the, yeah, the dialogue, like, the dialogue thing looked like what the dialogue stuff is in Horizon Zero Dawn, which is like a very limited part of the game that mostly exists so that when you talk to people, you can get more backstory if you want to, or you can skip the backstory if you don't want it. Right, but it seems like from people who've actually played it, there's more to it than yes, that. Yes, yeah. So yeah, it felt like the the E3 demo they showed was very sort of like limited. Yeah. It's the kind of thing of like I feel like they probably should have not even done the big cinematic trailer and had that big cool cinematic trailer as like when they originally sort of said like okay, this game has leaked, we'll just announce it. Yeah, and then have like a much more sort of fully fleshed out demo of the game the way that kind of Sony did. Yes, and then I did have to watch the the longer big E3 demo they released. Uh, several times to cut that trailer that I put together. Right. Yeah, which is I have not footage. seen that yet. Yeah, and so I, I much most of it with the sound off because I stripped the audio out as the first step. But um, it's cool. Like sailing is back in this game yes. in a big way. Like yeah. the Black Flag style. You're on a boat. You can do the combat. That's awesome. Somehow this is well. There was Assassin's Creed Rogue, which was a direct sequel. But like in the mainline series, this is the second time they've brought that back, which is nuts. Well, they have picked a setting of Greece that like it makes yes. a lot of sense. Like you'd need to have that, or you'd be right. very limited in yeah. where in Greece you are. And then just all the gameplay I saw looked really good. The fighting combat or style is different than Origins. It is not identical. Yeah, I they could have, not tell how exactly. Well, but. one thing that they have done, you can kind of see in the demos they showed, is um, it looks like you can in your skill tree unlock different abilities that are like it's mapped to different buttons that I think you could it looks like you would pull like one of the triggers or something as a modifier and then you can like pick X to do like a shockwave kind of attack or something yeah so it looks like it looks like it's the same sort of foundation of the origins combat but there's more sort of different ways you can customize and build on it on top of that which is good because the origins yeah. combat is is serviceable but very limited right uh, it's serviceable and very limited and is one of the problems I have with that game and that that game is really long, which isn't a problem in and of itself, but I think its various systems are not deep enough to support a game of yeah, that length. Yeah, the combat does not change much past the first, like, 12 hours after you've unlocked yeah. most of the significant abilities. Right. So, I guess my thought on Assassin's Creed Odyssey is that if it had been two or three years since Origins, uh-huh. I would be yes. very excited for this game. It would be a must-play. I would pre-order it. As it stands, it's been less than a year. Like six, I played it in December, so it's been like six, seven months. Yeah, since I, I played, played it in like February, and I and watching this made me be like, I never quite finished that game because other shit came out, and I kind of want to go back and finish it now. You should. It's a good yeah, game. But I like, like Bayek a lot. Yeah, but I just I'm looking. I'm like, I can't do one of these every year. We talked about this on the predictions podcast. It doesn't matter what the series is if it's a giant big RPG like that. That cannot be annualized and allow me to keep up my hype for it because it's a commitment and yeah, I just don't it's have not that. Fucking Call of Duty, you know. No. Like, I'm not into Call of Duty enough to do the annual thing. But if you are, like, it's well, it used to be like a six, eight hour long campaign. Now it's not even that. And then it's like an updated version of the multiplayer suite you've been playing for a while. Right. So it's like that's a very easy. Or Madden is a very similar model. It's like a very easy thing to just be like, oh, I'll play the new one next year if you have enough money to do it. Like, might as well. Assassin's Creed has always done been like this of although Origins is so much longer but even the older Assassin's Creed is like this is like a solid like 20 25 hour like 30 to 40 hour if you do everything game that is very like narrative heavy in a lot of ways and that's a bad kind of thing to make annual and it was bad when they used to do it cuz like most of these Assassin's Creed games are fucking bad and it seems like such a misfire to do it now especially because this game looks so cool and interesting and I really want to play it but I'm like you it's like I haven't even fucking finished Assassin's Creed Origins and there's DLC that came out for that game that people really like it sounds good like I too much of it I don't know how I will or when I will play this game yeah I have no idea how I would fit it in is the other part because it's October 3rd it's yeah. it's a month that let me bring up my video game calendar because obviously that month is Red Dead as well which I think is a mistake to put it out then but you've got in the same 
week as this game, you have uh, Black Ops 4, you have Forza Horizon 4, yep. you have Mega Man 11, if you're into that. I'm just reading off just a partial list here. And then Red Dead 2 at the end of the month. I I can get why some of these other games would go up against Red Dead 2. This one makes no sense, because I get your big Ubisoft, but I do think there's going to be a significant amount of people... Me, like, honestly, heart of hearts, I'd probably rather play this than Red Dead 2, but I have a fucking podcast, and I'm going to have to play Red Dead 2, and I'm not going to buy AC Odyssey and burn myself off on a big, uh, burn myself on a big open world game right yeah. before I play another big open world game. Especially because Assassin's Creed Odyssey, while it looks like really good and interesting and a nice advancement of what Origins does, it doesn't look like ambitious in the way that, like, no. you, you, like, if you play video games, you weirdly have to play what the next Rockstar game is going to be just to, like, know what the fu- Like, have they decided to change anything about how Rockstar makes games? Like, what is a Rockstar game? Because they only make one every fucking five or six years. Yeah. They don't make one every fucking year. If they made one every fucking year, I would skip a lot of them. You right. Know? Yeah, so I, I don't get it. I really don't fully understand their strategy on Assassin's Creed at this point because... This is just the weirdest annualized franchise. And frankly, it's at its weirdest when it's good. Yeah. Because imagine how much hype there would be for every Assassin's Creed if it was like a every three years thing. Yeah. It would just be every it would be an event every time. And I have to imagine they'd make more money that way. But I don't know. I'm not I don't have the spreadsheet that tells them they have to crap one of these out every year. But that's the thing. They don't look crapped out. Yeah, well, this one doesn't. Like, usually they do. This one doesn't. And And Origins didn't either. So it's, yeah. But Origins was also the one where they took the year off. Right. So it felt, like, appropriate. That's like, oh, cool. Like, Assassin's Creed has changed. It's big. It's new. So who knows? Maybe I'll, it'll be December for me or something. But Yeah. It's like, I want to play it so bad because I've been wanting an Ancient Greece Assassin's Creed game for a while. It's like, fuck it. Although, part of what I would be worried about, even though it seems like they're doing well by it, is... This is a situation kind of like Assassin's Creed Syndicate where they have now set in the area and era I know a lot about. It's just like the last time they did that, it really made me not like the game as much as I probably would have otherwise. Because I, all I saw was this is not like anywhere near as good a use of Karl Marx as you could have possibly done. Why are you doing it like this? Because nobody gives a shit and nobody knows anything about Karl Marx. In the same way that like Socrates is probably not going to be like a super interesting version of that like historical figure in this game. Because nobody gives a shit about Socrates except for me. Right. So anyway, uh, yeah, who knows? But that's that's Ubisoft. It was fine. I thought there were some yeah. fun parts. There were some low parts. There's a lot of games yeah. they showed that I want to play. There's some games they showed I don't want to play. It was an E3 show. Yes. There was no Splinter Cell. Okay. There, there was no Battle Royale. They didn't talk about any sort of streaming service, which was refreshing, you know, because it's like I don't want to give I don't give a shit about game streaming yet because that's like five to ten years in the future. <laughs> I think more than that. Yeah. Uh, it's, Yeah. It, it, it was a, it was an interesting. I think it's one of the weaker years for Ubisoft because Ubisoft typically has like a bunch of interesting new game announcements. And this was there's a lot of wheel spinning between like talking about Rainbow Six Siege and talking about the Crew Two and talking about the Division Two and talking about fucking For Honor and and Mario and Rabbids. At least Mario and Rabbids like had a cool way to present that information. But it's also a DLC expansion for like, a game that came out last year. You know, and like that was about half, if not more than half, of their presentation, which just comes across as like. Again, a, a wheel spinning kind of year for Ubisoft. It's, I think I think this happened with a lot of companies this year. They picked the amount of time they were going to fill, and then they decided what to fill it with. Yeah. They did not look at what they had and then organically decide how much time to fill. Or, like, or, or it was Microsoft where they picked the amount of time they wanted, and then they just said, hey, does anybody have a video game trailer? Because we've got fucking time to show it. That's my point. Microsoft yeah. said, we got two hours. Who wants in? Yeah. But I think we're all very excited to play Starfall Rise of Atlantis later this year. Okay. So, let's get to the good one. Sony. Yep. Sony. Sony. So, Sony, for a couple of years, has been doing this interesting, like, riff on what an E3 press conference is, yeah. where they really pare it down. They do not show 50 games. They show, nope. like, 10 max or something, and they really focus in on a couple of major, not just first-party titers, titles, but, you know, Sony online entertainment titles, or Sony Interact. What do they call it now? SIE, Sony Interactive Entertainment? Um, yeah, Sony Worldwide. Sony Worldwide, yeah. yeah. So, th- they've gone through a name change at some point. So yes, anyway, they have, but, they've done a couple of those. Yeah. So, Sony Worldwide, like, you know, their direct first First parties, they do a big showcase for it, like a, a nice, meaty, in-depth demo that makes you feel like you get to know what the game is. And they kind of tripled down on that this yeah. year, where they just selected four games, Death Stranding, Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us Part Two, and Spider-Man. Yeah. 
And those were the four pillars of this show. And they had a couple things sprinkled in between, some of which was very cool here and there. But mostly it was just that. It was not a bunch of major announcements. They didn't have anyone on stage talking about stuff except at the very beginning. Um, they weren't announcing any new hardware or subscription plans or anything like that. It was nothing necessarily revelatory except those games they showed off, to me at least, were so fucking good yeah. and such good demos that I walked away much more hyped from this show than any of the ones so far. It really was like sometimes like an edge of your seat experience. And the message was kind of laser clear, even though no one came out and vocalized it, which is we have some really fucking cool games. They are experimental. They are big. They are adult. They are out there. They are like things you have not necessarily gone and played before. And the only place you can play them is on our system. So I thought it had this interesting mix of that meta, like, here's what we want to tell you about the PlayStation, and then also, like, hype you up for some cool shit. And, yeah, like, I thought all four of those demos were A-plus amazing things to watch. Yeah, Sony's conference was weird to me because, I like, those four demos are four of the best things that have been shown at E3 for this year for sure. And, like, all four of those games look really interesting. I mean, Death Stranding, I'm still not entirely convinced it's a video game, but they showed something that looked like it was a third-person camera that you could control with the stick. So yes. maybe it is a video game. Probably not yet. But, you know, they're getting there. But even then, it was a really cool-looking demo. And so that stuff was all really good. The, I thought it was weird the structure they decided to do was kind of had this sort of, like, hitchy feel to it because they did announce a couple of other games and they had, like, you know, a fucking some Black Ops stuff and Destiny 2 stuff that felt out of place when they specifically, like, they didn't just pitch this on, like, Twitter. Sean Layden at the beginning came out and said, we're doing, we're focusing deep dives on these four games and that's our E3 thing. And it's like, if you say that, like, that should be what you're doing. And I do wish that there were, that they, like, kind of just only did those four games and had... Like, did the big gameplay game with demos and then pulled someone or a couple of people from the dev teams to kind of talk about the games. I think that would be the version of this I would, that would be more ideal because I think they, there was like space to do that and like time to do that. And instead of taking that time to do that, they showed another Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer. <laughs> It was at least a new one. It was, yes. It was It was a lot more new than the last one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I liked it, though. I liked everything we saw. I thought the one weirdest hitch was they started in a church, because that's the setting of the Last of Us 2 scene. Yeah. And then they had to move everyone to a different venue, and they had about 20 minutes there yeah. of an intermission where they showed some other stuff and had basically more of the pre-roll show with, like, guys interviewing people. Yeah, from, like, the PS blog. Yeah, yeah. and... That was fine. They, that's where they showed the Call of Duty and Destiny yeah. 2 stuff, so it didn't bother me too much being right there. But it was it was a weird, hitchy thing. I it just, agree. like, you th- slowed the momentum of the show down to a fucking, like, crawl. Especially because it's like, you have the time here and the space here to do so. Like, there are developers from Naughty Dog that are at this show. Right. Like, if you're going to do this, at least have them there. You know, because in the post-show, they were showing some, like, Spider-Man stuff that has a developer from Insomniac talking about Spider-Man. You know yeah. that there are developers for all these studios here at E3, like, I, watching the show. Have them talk about the game if you have this weird dead space. I do think the best version of this show would have been, like, 60 Minutes... It wasn't much over more than that. It was like yeah. 70 total. But like 60 minutes, 15 on each game. Do like they had two musical performances, maybe even figure out a third and fourth for the other ones. Right, yeah. Have the demo, have a little thing at the end talking to people, and then just do that super focused. And then maybe they could have had like a supplementary show or something where they showed off some of that other stuff. Because there were some other really good trailers they showed. Yeah. Yeah, and like it's not, a couple of the other announcements were interesting, but it also like those announcements felt like they were kind of undercut because they weren't set up well. Because I was sitting there waiting, like thinking like we're going to see four games, and then you're right. like announcing some actually like interesting and kind of anticipated titles. Yeah, yeah. but still, like the the layout was weird. The content was so ludicrously good. Yeah. It feels uh-huh. like looking at Gift Horse in the eye not to focus on that. Yes. So let's uh let's focus on that, Sean. Yeah, so first up was The Last of Us Part Two, and they had uh, Gustavo Santaolalla, the, the composer of the first game, also the composer of the second game. Come Two-time out on- Academy Award winner. Yes. One of the only composers to win back-to-back. I think yeah. he might be the only one. T- turns out he's really fucking good yeah. at this shit, and, and his style is obviously very unique. It was a very, like, it's a very unique video game soundtrack for that first game, and it's one of my favorites. Um, and so he came out on stage 
wearing a, like, just full on a hoodie with the hood up and just sat down on a stool with a fucking banjo and just played, like, a sort of, like, banjo riff version of the main theme of The Last of Us, which is obviously, like, very slow and moody. And I just love that they spent about five minutes at the beginning of their conference with us watching an, an, an older Argentinian man play the theme for their video game on a banjo. It was perfect. Yes. It, it is the Sony version of The Dancing Bear. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know right. if there's anything else to say. In no, my was, notes, I say he is rocking that fucking hoodie. Oh, rocking it. It was magical. It wasn't a stool. It was a fold-out little chair like what we're okay. sitting on now, right, which yeah. is, just added to the ambiance. But yes, uh, that was perfect. And then the demo. God, yeah. Sean. So wh- how they structured it is with... And I don't know if this is how this looks in the game or whatever. You right. know, we'll see. But it's it was an older Ellie, you know, clearly aged up, like yes. a teenager, young adult, uh, at this, like, church event thing. Yeah, there's like, like a church dance happening. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you're supposed to take this as, like, a dream sequence or a literal, like, society has rebuilt enough that this is something that's happening. I mean, I don't know if society has to rebuild that much to have, like, 20 people in a church dancing. Sure, one, but you know, would have to rebuild yeah. a little from what we saw yes. last time. But yes, and there's this sort of sexual tension between her and another woman there, and they kiss, and during the kiss, it goes into a long gameplay sequence where she is... Uh, as happens in The Last of Us, yeah. being threatened by some very bad humans and has to murder them brutally. Yeah. And that gameplay sequence was stunning and edge of your seat and very much The Last of Us gameplay. It made you feel like, okay, they haven't missed a beat on that. Yeah. And it, then at the end, you come back yeah. to the scene and end it with a very ominous kind of final line. And wow. Yeah, it was. It, it is like the kind of demo that you go to E3 for. Of like, yes. it's so perfectly structured. It's so perfectly paced. You know, it looks gorgeous. Like the the, the graphical design and the cinematography and all that. You know, the naughty dogness of it is there in full force. And just the framing of it is very smart because it gives you a a narrative context and grounding, which is the thing you expect from a sequel to The Last of Us in the demo. And so it kind of. It, it got me in the mood for then, like, once it got violent and it got into the kind of action stealth stuff, it, it felt contextualized appropriately, yes. as opposed to, like, the Tomb Raider demo that did not do that at all. So let's talk about the different components of it. Yeah. So first, that the, the scene in the church, the cut scene, basically. Yeah. I, I just, I, I wrote this on Twitter, and I don't think there's any way else to say it. Nobody in the video game industry, pretty much anywhere in the world, I think is as good as just writing the voices of human beings, like recognizable that you would see in the world, hear in the world, as Naughty Dog is. And that was so phenomenally on display in that scene in just the nuances of the language, of the performance, of the animation, of the spaces between people, in the spaces between what is and isn't said. They're, they're, it, they just are on a level that I don't think you see. And not to put down other even kinds of video right. game writing, but there's just this sense of immediacy and realism and like a significant like voice to these games uh, that is like nothing else in this space and then obviously the quality of the animation and performance and everything um haunting hauntingly good because it's a combination of both like the writing is so amazing but then it's also they are so good at capturing and translating these like really great performances that they get you know so it's that and, and then it's also just the sort of, like, cinematic framing of it. Because, like, again, like, it is the beginning and end of the demo is clearly a sort of, like, fixed cutscene. And it is, like, the pacing of that scene is so on point, And it's slow. And it's and it, and it just, like, lets you sort of, like, sit there and be with Ellie. And I like that it is basically, it feels like Ellie's sort of, like, you know, high school teen drama or whatever. Because she's, like, upgraded from, like, a sort of, like, 13-year-old to probably being, like, 17, 18-ish, it looks like. And that, like... You know, that sort of, like, she's hanging out at the bar and kind of chatting with her guy friend. And it's like it's like this, like, queer teen romance thing that's happening that then in the middle of that, because you know it's Last of Us, you know, you know, things are not that easy in the world that Ellie lives in. That, like, everything that her sort of, like, normal life experience has is reflected by this, like, dark trauma and, and like, violence that she inflicts and violence that is inflicted on her because of the world she lives in. And, like, those two things exist within her at the same time. Yes. 
Yeah. Was Ellie aged up like that in that first reveal yes. teaser? Yes, I think it's the more it's more obvious here because that was the, obviously that like when they did that first teaser, it was not like an in game character model and stuff. Right. It was about like what they were kind of projecting her to look like. Okay. Yeah, like she was definitely aged up. I think it looks more significant this in this. Yes, it feels thing. like they've altered the character model or it's just more finished or something. Yeah. But that was great. Um, uh, we've only seen Joel in that one moment in that first teaser, yeah. and we have not seen him since. He is referenced obliquely here, possibly. Yes, as as your old man to Ellie, so they don't even name yeah. him by name. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I kept on thinking, like, oh, maybe, like, the thing, once, like, the shit hit the fan in the gameplay section, is like, oh, is that going to be the thing? Is, like, Joel comes in and helps her at the end or something? No. And nope. No sign of him. I, I do wonder how Joel is going to be deployed in this game. Yeah. I'm pretty much assuming she's the main playable character in this one. Almost certainly, yeah. Almost certainly, but yeah. So we'll see how what his role is. But in the gameplay section, yeah. just... Naughty Dog is... It's, I don't know how to say it. They're so good at what they do. They're so confident. Their E3 demos are always great. Because what it is is, like, clearly this is a very scripted playthrough oh, yeah. to make certain things happen. But it's got this perfect line between being like a great cinematic action, you know, stealth thriller sequence, and you feel the playable immediate tension of it. And I just, like, breathless at moments. And it, what it did that was, I think, the biggest success. It made me remember what it was like yeah. to play The Last of Us for the first time and be in those moments where you felt like the life or death stakes of the characters. Because that is something The Last of Us does that virtually no other video game does, yeah. is make you truly feel life or death stakes. You know, even in a game where if you die, you come back. Like, it just makes you feel it. And this made me feel it again with Ellie in that sequence. Yeah, it's incredibly tense. And, it, and like, the main thing I kept on feeling was, like, fuck, I need to replay The Last of Us now. Yep, me too, <laughs> like, it's, me too. It's, because it is that thing of you kind of... Because, you know, it's been a couple of years since I played it. Because, I mean, God, it's been, like, probably five years. Because I think I played the... Because I, I replayed the remastered version they put out in, like, 2013 or something. Or 2014. So it, yeah, it came out 2013, 4. and then the remaster was 2014. Yeah, so it's been, like, four years since I played it. And, and you kind of forget that... That sort of flow and in, in like ebb and flow intenseness to the the Last of Us combat, which is so unique, you yes. know that, and they do such a good job of structuring and developing this gameplay demo where it starts with her entirely sneaking and kind of like spying on these people. Then she does a couple of stealth kills and it's kind of like moving through this area, and then she gets discovered. And that's like always the thing in The Last of Us is that turn of like, oh, like I'm trying to be very methodical. I'm setting some shit up and it shows her kind of like planning a little bit out and like, you know, being ready to sort of pounce on these people. But then once someone else notices her, everything hits the fan and it's like balls to the wall. Like I have to like just run and, and Last of Us has some of just the best like fucking just like, oh fuck, I need to get out of here sprinting in any game. It's like, oh shit. And leaping over cover. And it's just like, and it goes from there of her like, like, kind of get, ducking back into cover and then coming back out a little bit to, like, take out a couple of other people and then, like, that sort of, like, cat and mouse game that is very much the the combat structure of The Last of Us is so unique and just tense and so perfectly executed in that first game and then how it's demoed here. And it's one of the things that makes this demo, I think, as effective as it is, is that we have the foundation of the original Last of Us to know that... Obviously, some of, like, this stuff is canned, and it's, like, a very sort of, like, curated playthrough of the section, and some of the animations look like, ah, that animation is not going to be quite as perfect in the actual game. You can see the E3 demo in it, but because you have the foundation of, like, the first game, you can see very much, like, that shit is real. Like, you when know she, they're not bluffing. When she has to, like, go over and, like, pick up, like, a little, like, thing of explosive crap on the ground and, like, craft an explosive arrow, which is one of their, like, you can make explosive things of, like, you know, not having to tell you. This is one of the new things that's in the game, but they're, like, the craftable menu was very clearly expanded. That when she has to make that arrow and then shoot it at that person, like, that's, that is the kind of thing in that same sort of tension is what is in that Last of Us combat. And it just reminded me of how much I enjoy and, like, like enjoy and kind of dread that aspect of The Last of Us because it is, yes. like, very enjoyable, but in that sort of, like, thriller movie kind of way of... It, this is a very edge-of-the-seat kind of demo. Like, the the way that you are just, like, rooting for Ellie of just, like... The, 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 you know, the deck is very much stacked against her when the shit starts off and, like, the way she has to sort of, like, slowly crawl back up to, like, like kind of an even playing field and then finally, like, take out that last guy is is really thrilling. 
Oh yeah, the the Last of Us is the dark mirror universe of Uncharted, uh, where yeah. Uncharted is fun and light and breezy, and it's like candy. You just eat it up, and the Last of Us is. You realize, you know, ten minutes into any given combat encounter that you're gripping the controller so tight you're hurting your hands. Yeah. There, there's a part in this gameplay demo that is probably the part that, like, sealed it the most for me in terms of, like, my memory of playing the first Last of Us is when she's running towards one of the enemies about halfway through, like, after shit has broken out. And she, like, grabs a bottle off the top of, like, a piece of cover and just chucks it in the dude's face before she punches him. Which that is, like, that is the moment I kind of fell in love with The Last of Us's like, version of combat in the first game when in one of, like, the sort of, the big encounter at the, in the, kind of, the tutorial opening section. Right. Where you're in, like, that kind of shipyard. That was what I did. Like, shit broke out, and I sprinted at a dude, pulled a brick out of my pocket, fucking threw it in his face, and it shattered in his face, and then just laid him out. And that was, like, that sort of really tense, kind of gritty, violent feel to it. That's the kind of thing that is kind of like almost like what I like to do in God of War of like, I'm going to throw this fucking thing at you. It's going to stun you for a second. And then I just lay you out with like a fucking Superman running punch. And there's something about that that is very satisfying to do in a video game for me. Very much so. And I will probably be playing The Last of Us again pretty soon. Yeah. Because <laughs> holy crap. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I was like, I was thinking, I'm like, do I have time? And then I remember, I'm like, that game's only like 15 hours long. Of course I have time. Yes, yeah. That was nice and easy. It's, it's only 15 hours long, and I've played it through a couple of times. Yeah, so, so I know what I'm doing. even quicker. Yeah. yeah. This was great. I did get, uh, Thomas, my brother, was watching this conference with me, because he now owns a PlayStation. So I'm like, you oh, should yeah. watch this. And he was like, ah, oh, shit. I was like, do you have The Last of Us? I'm like, yeah, I have The Last of Us. Like, you, I'm like, I should play that game. I'm like, yeah. yeah, you should play that fucking game. And that remastered version looks real good. That's oh, a good it looks remaster. great. Yeah. yeah. All right. What was the next part? Uh, the next part was we kind of already talked about it, like right. the weird sort of like we're gonna we're gonna have some like the PlayStation blog dudes from the pre-show and we're here's Black Ops Four DLC where Black Ops maps are in our Black Ops games. It's like okay, yes, uh, and, Black Ops Three is free on PS Plus tonight. Did you see that? I didn't know. Yeah, they announced it in the same part. I, I, I very much was tuning out okay. at some point because it's like. I don't yes. know what you're doing. It is that was Sean Layden left. I was like, there's nothing interesting you're going to be talking about. They had the Black Ops guys on, and they announced that that was like a free gift for E3 people. It's it's a it's a well, not for E3 for PlayStation Plus people. Is it? It, I, it has not gone up yet, from what I see. But yes, Black Ops Three is supposed to be free for PS4 for any PS Plus user, which is a nice little gift. Yes, I, from what I understand, the celebrity cameo in that campaign is Christopher Maloney of Law and Order SVU fame. So that's a trade up from Kevin. Spacey as nice. I found, though. So, that's, you know, sure. Call of yes. Duty Black Ops 3. I When I played the beta of that game, I did not enjoy the multiplayer, but people like that game. Yeah. At least that does the fucking Roman numerals properly. You yes. know? This is something I can't say about this new Black Ops game. But other than that, they showed, like, a quick reel of some, like, a couple of VR games. Um, Days Gone got sort of shoved in there in a way that's like... Okay, so here's yeah. the question. Days Gone has gotten a release date. Yes, it's February 22nd, 2019, with every like, other video game. Yes, every game is on February 22nd now. Do they just... Are they, like, assuming no one's going to play that game? Because that is bizarre. That Okay, I mean, this is a bigger conversation we have to have. Yeah. They had four pillars tonight. Only Not only is only one of those dated, the other three, Death Stranding... Uh, Last of Us 2 and Ghost of Tsushima don't have a year attached right, yeah. to them. They could all very easily be at E3 next year and probably will be. And they do have a game, Days Gone, that is coming out before the next E3, apparently. Yeah. And they showed like a 30 second TV spot. That feels like a weird lack of confidence from Sony to me. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is from... I've I've heard some scuttlebutt by game journalists that that was like... There was a big sort of political fight that happened internally at Sony about... We cannot show two zombie games prominently okay. at E3. Only one of our zombie games is going to get shown prominently at E3. And it's not going to be the one made by Sony Bend. It is going to be the one made by Naughty Dog that is a sequel to one of our best-selling first-party titles. Okay. So I think that's part of it. I think there is... Don't forget, they do have PSX that they do in, in like December. Yeah. So there is another venue to make one last push for that game. Like I think they are definitely deprioritizing it because every... The thing I've heard from people who have played like E3 demos of that game in past years, and I think they had it at the Judges Week thing, which is something where some game journalists get to sort of like play through some of the games that are going to be on the show floor a couple of weeks beforehand to sort of like, you know, shore up their previews and that kind of stuff. Um, all, everything I've heard from that stuff is that it is not great. Yeah. So, and, and it, it is close enough now to release that it seems like that is not a like, oh, it might get better eventually. It seems like that game is probably not going to be great. Yeah. It feels like the very rare. Uh, Sony first party misfire from this yeah. generation. And I guess all I would say about that political fight is if you know one of your major like first party franchises by your best developer is a zombie game, 
Maybe don't greenlight another zombie game. Yeah, it's, it's but really it's easy also, not to greenlight zombie games. But it is like the, one of the things that has very clearly, and they kind of Sean Lee kind of talked about this. One of their main policies at Sony that's worked out so well for them is to just stand by whatever their studios are doing. So it's like my Media Molecule has been making that Dreams game for like five or six years. It's almost done. That's one that like I kind of wish they showed some of that because what I have heard from people who have seen that at Judges Week is that Dreams game actually sounds really fucking cool. Yeah, and that's that's definitely going to be a thing that they do a big push at PSX because that doesn't have a date yet. But yeah, so it's like, you know, Sony's strategy, and it's obviously it's going to have some of those misfires, but there was a chance that, like, because the pitch for Days Gone is very, on, like, paper, is very different than The Last of Us Part Two. It's open world, it's, like, bikers, it's not, like, tense stealth action, it's more, like, giant, like, flowing hordes of zombies, like that World War Z movie. So it's like I like I think in execution they end up looking very similar graphically. I think the pitches could be different enough that I can understand green lighting it. Is it different enough from every other fucking post apocalyptic game coming out that's also open world and you got on a bike and you're shooting stuff? You they're usually they're aren't on a bike. I guess you're not. usually in okay. a car. You're okay, they're, they're, if, like, Sean, if, you, Sean, if you're if a bike is your biggest differentiation, you have a fucking problem. This, this is, a, this is the th- like if they sat down and said, "What if we did Sons of Anarchy with zombies in it?" Like that's a pitch for a video game. That no, I like, would throw it in their face and tell them to get the fuck out of my office and come back to the drawing board and make me something that doesn't look like every other goddamn video game out there and doesn't sound stupid. There is a line, I think, where you can give maybe too much creative freedom. Sure, and it's going like it's it's never going to be perfect. But I could, yeah. I'm just saying that like I can see in the pre production phase of being like you know because Sony Bend is also a studio that I think was typically like kind of in their mobile like we make like yeah. PSP and PS Vita games and this was like their we want to try to make like you know like a full like fully supported like big main like Sony first party game and this is like yeah. their first shot at that. Okay. I'm just saying this, like, because, like, I am with you in that I am very tired of zombie stuff, but fucking, like, the zombie thing has been a huge trend for, like, 20 fucking years straight now. It has to sell so well, you know? Like, they, they're That's making it. another Walking Dead season. They're making, they've made, like, four of those from, from Telltale, you know? Like, I the guess. Walking Dead just got, like, a new spinoff a couple of years ago. Like, that shit's still fucking going. It has the, to be. I mean, really the Walking popular. Dead TV show is, is really dying in popularity. Yeah. But, yeah, so, I don't know. It's... I, I just think that it's it's so... I mean, I'm glad they didn't show it because it looks yeah. like all the other post-apocalyptic games. But there is just a line where, like, when everyone is making the same thing, I, 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 it's, it's just... It's a weird place where Sony's, like, corporate moves with their game studios have generally been so smart and moving against the grain, not towards it. And that's such a toward-the-grain move that everyone else is doing. That's where I get confused. I, I mean, don't care. It's not it is, my money. Yeah. Whatever. But I wonder if part of it is also that, like... You know, like, like post-apocalyptic things have been, again, like, super popular since, like, Hunger Games-ish in America. You know, like, yes. that's, like, every fucking... There's a, there was a really interesting graph I saw a couple of years ago about, like, the young adult novel market and, like, dystopian, like, post-apocalyptic kind of novels before Hunger Games and, like, their average sales. And then after Hunger Games, it was, like... It was like the before shouldn't have even been on the graph because it was so low you couldn't even see it, right? right? And so it is something of, I wonder if part of the post-apocalyptic trend specifically in video games was kind of started by The Last of Us because a lot of the games that we're seeing now would have been starting development if you get like a three to five year development oh, cycle uh, around that time. Undoubtedly. It is yeah. this, and you actually see this in animated movies a lot too because they take so long. Like, you know, I don't know, like Shark Tale and Finding Nemo or Ants and A Bug's Life or like these different ones where you have two movies on the exact same topic come out a year apart where something is in the water and then everyone does the same thing and then you have a couple years later everyone has clearly done the same thing and and everyone's looking around like shit we should have checked with the other people (laughs) this is bad but um yeah it's whatever I think it's an interesting move. It, yeah, it's interesting. Like, but, if, if the, there was, like, when they first demoed that game, I thought they had some promise with, like, the the very interesting, like, horde thing that, like, first demo, like, that was some interesting tech, and then it seems like it has gone nowhere from that. Who knows? I am very curious to read the reviews when it comes out, yeah. if there are any critics left over to review it on February 22nd, 2019, when every video game <laughs> ever is coming out. Yeah, Red Dead, because that feels like kind of like the thing, like everybody had the same idea. Everybody looked at Red Dead Redemption 2 coming out in late October as like, fucking, like, that's a bomb that destroys November. It just fucks the entire month of November for almost everybody outside, like, Bethesda. You know? So it's like, we have to get out of there. Where do we put it? Like, we're not gonna put it in December because I don't know why they think that you cannot release a video game in December. 
fucking something Christmas. I don't know. Um, so then, and, and not we're gonna we're not gonna release it in January because who releases anything in January? That's the first month. Only posers release something in January. Everything's going in February. All of it. It gives us a nice cushion, so we have a good month to delay our games to the end of March before the fiscal year ends. It's the perfect date, and everybody is fucking releasing a video game in February, and it terrifies me. It does. It really does. Especially if Kingdom Hearts three makes that uh, date Late of January, January 29th. Yeah. Uh, just uh, clearly seeing the hype around that. That game is also going to flatten a lot of other releases. I think. Yeah. But we'll see. Yeah, February is going to be brutal. All right. So what was after Days Gone? Um, there's a really quick Destiny two Forsaken trailer that. Whatever. I really like how every Destiny campaign is something really bad happens at the start, and your friend, it seems like all hope is lost, but then Ghost reveals that there's a magical spinning doodad out in the universe, and if you go get the magical spinning doodad and bring it back, then hope will not be lost, and you restore the light, and everything's happy, and you go dance at the tower until the next time all hope is lost, and you have to go find a spinning doodad. Yeah, like Destiny, trailers for Destiny and Destiny expansions are now starting to very much feel like trailers for MMOs. That's yes. like, it was like, like watching that like Black Desert Online trailer that was on the Microsoft stage of like this is nothing like it, it's so clearly nothing because what the game is is so untrailerable you know like you can't show a trailer of someone running a strike like five times and getting like progressively like slightly better assault rifles you know like that's the that's the market that mostly they are appealing to is like the hardcore Destiny fans with some broader appeal of like the main story content it's so fucking like you you can't do it like you can't no. make trailers for it over and over again it's impossible all right what was next Next up was what actually might be my favorite demo and like sequence of the entire show for reasons that will probably be honest obvious when I say the name of the game is Ghost of Tsushima. Mine too. Yeah, that pretty fucking, easily. The one thing I want is if they don't have a Japanese dub of the, obviously it's an English it's an American it's a game made by an American studio it's made from probably mostly American market it is going to have an English voiceover and all that I get that I'm not upset about that. There's no world in which, like, this is primarily a Japanese-voiced game with English subtitles. That would be fucking impossible. It would be amazing, but... It would be amazing, but, like, obviously I'm the dude that I would... Even if I didn't speak Japanese, I would still be the dude that wants the Japanese voices yes, for this game. So I hope that... Because obviously they're going to make a Japanese dub. There's... Actually, I have seen some footage of the Japanese dub of God of War, and it's really fucking good. And right. Japanese Kratos is really fucking cool. Well, I mean, one, this is Sony, a Japanese yeah. company, and this is Ghost of Tsushima, a game set in Japan. Yeah. They're and gonna they dub. have a policy of, of doing pretty big... Like, they have, there's, like, full Japanese dubs of Last of Us and Uncharted. Like, all their right. games, they get full Japanese dubs with, like, big actors and the big voice actors in. And so I'm sure they're going to have that. I just desperately want them to put in... They're not... There's, they're not because they never do. Like the, it's going to be. There's going to be a French dub. There's going to be a Spanish dub. I could imagine them breaking the, that policy for this one at least as like a DLC thing. Yeah, maybe. I mean, here's here's the one thing: is there are potential the maybe the the kinds of deals they sign with actors in Japan. There's all sorts of contracting yeah. things that could make that tough. But if it is at all possible. Uh, I, I agree. I really hope they do it because I would play it in Japanese yeah. easily. And there is a non-zero chance that I just get the Japanese version of this oh, game. Oh, you probably should, John. Yeah, that's like that's that was kind of how I was I feeling watching it, and it made me think about you know at the beginning of the trailer because so one of the cool things about you know it's a it's a big demo, yeah, and it, it shows a lot. It is fucking unbelievably gorgeous. Oh, it's like so that's crazy. That's like number one. Like that first shot. Is so beautiful of of just this this long shot with the bamboo forest on the left and like a hill a grassy hill going like up sloping gently to the right and like the clouds in the background and your main character on his horse like slowly riding out of the bamboo like trotting out of the bamboo forest just fucking gorgeous like that's a gif I want I just want that gif in my head you know this this feels like if they put out some nice wallpapers this could finally supplant Zelda Breath of the Wild as my yeah. desktop wallpaper. It, no, it's amazing. It, clearly, they have uh, done their history on Japanese cinema and how yes. the Japanese countryside is framed in samurai films because mm. they've got it to a T. There are like five different Kurosawa references in this one trailer, <laughs> which is great. But like the whole thing, like it, it's amazing that this came from Sucker Punch. Uh -huh, like that's yeah. the, not to put them down. I just mean like. There is no world in which you would look at any Infamous game, even yeah. the best of them, like Second Son, great game. Yeah. But you would never look at Infamous Second Son and then say, you know what, in five years, those guys are going to make the most beautiful looking Japanese set game ever. You would be like, no, you're crazy. They're going to be making Infamous Fifth Son. You yeah. Know, whatever. But it, it's like the Horizon Zero Dawn effect to the nth degree. Yes. But it's also like... it. <laughs> 
because I think when I think about the way that Infamous Second Son looks and like some of the stuff they do with that game when it's like at its most sort of spectacular, and with all the lighting, yeah, like it makes so much sense of what it they does. do with color and lighting in this trailer. Like it feels like they took all that tech that they did for like the neon effects in Infamous Second Son is like how can we do this but for like natural light, yes, and, and but and like stylized natural light, and it, it has that effect of like it reminds me of like a Kagemusha Iran or some of like the other Kurosawa color movies and like the use of color there. I mean, it's, it's so specific. Gorgeous. It almost looks less like his movies than his watercolor sketches. He yes, would that's do. a good point. His yeah. concept art. If you've never seen that, look that up. The, the Criterion Blu-rays have like booklets with all of this. But but he would like do because Kurosawa started his career as a painter. So for these big color movies, he literally just would do paintings to kind of like give himself like a, a foundation for what he wanted it to look like. And they kind of like the color and use of light look almost more like that than his yeah. actual films, which are limited by. The constraints of reality. Yes, so this has... Because obviously it's a video game, so it has a very stylized element yes. to it. And yeah, it's, it is not a realistic looking game. It does... Like, even though it's like... it, You know, they look like trees. They look like people. It's not like a cartoon looking no. thing. But they, they do enough to feel like... It is like almost a little bit impressionistic with the way that like the, the leaves sort of blend into the clouds the, and everything, and the way like grass moves very yeah. much like Breath of the Wild uh-huh. in yeah. that very impressionistic like that 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 gentle sway where it's like grass doesn't really move like that, but it's how you see it in your head it moving, and and it kind of looks like how grass like in the wind looks in black and white movies, yeah, with like the way that the lighting catches and like kind of highlights individual blades, it has yes. that element to it. So there was that, but yeah. then also. The gameplay. Yeah. Just, one, this looks like, oh, this is kind of a giant open world thing. That's crazy. Yes. And you you meet these guys and you pull out your samurai sword. And the first combat encounter in that demo is just straight up the end of Sanjuro. Yes. Where they stand off, they wait, wait. And then just yes. geyser of blood. Yes, he he does like the sort of Ido like quick draw technique, just like slashes the dude across the body. Geyser of blood shoots out. It is it is a bloody violent game in the way that like those good like seventy samurai movies, like a lot of Hideo Gosha movies, look like they're yep. like just super fucking violent, just blood spewing everywhere, arms getting chopped off. So fucking good. And it, it, I do like that there is like the visual element and design of this game does feel like it's sort of cherry picking. The best of like the entire that kind of like Jedi Geki era like style yes. of, of samurai movie stretching from like all the stuff from the forties like it, like through the fifties to the sixties and the seventies and going like all the great like black and white movies to the really interesting colored movies and like that whole stretch in like era of film they are pulling everything from that and and it's so just. It's so per- like it, it's one of the kind of like what I was hoping the game would be when they first showed the trailer. It's like it's a game for us. Like it's it like is a they, game for us. It's it, people that get us making this fucking video game, Jonathan. Oh yeah, it's because it's it looks like like some of the way they they show the violence is like the the blood of like a lone wolf and cub. Yes, with yeah. with the like precision of a Kurosawa and the overall you know maybe you know f- you know kind of uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say like allure or. Um, Prestige uh-huh. of a Kurosawa or a Harakiri. Yeah. What's that director's name? Uh, Mas- Kobayashi. Kobayashi, like that kind of, you know, like kind of, you know, that sort of golden age Japanese prestige and like craft with that, you know, more 60s, 70s Japanese, yeah. like, what if we just put an entire fountain of blood uh-huh. in this blood pack? And it's like, did you like that scene at the end of Sandra? Let's make that all these fights. Yes, let's yeah. do that every movie. Uh, but it really, like... Because the whole way the combat works, I don't know how exactly it's going to control as a yeah. video game, but it looked so interesting and fluid because it's not a bunch of, like, slash, 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 like, no. little precise movements. And then I loved... Every time before he put it in his his back in the holder, yeah. he did the whip the blood off, put yeah. it back in. And there were a couple of different animations of like there's some you would like whip it off. There's like the best one is probably because it's you know you see it sometimes in the samurai movies of him wiping it on like his his elbow and like putting it inside his elbow and yes. running running like the blood into the bay, blade clock across his elbow. It's like so fucking good. The overall attention to detail was nuts. You get to that sequence where he saves the boy, yeah. and then the boy gets shot, and he has the standoff with the woman who was his friend. Yeah. And just the way that is framed with that otherworldly red, orange, yeah. auburn lighting, and the colors, and the grass swaying, and that classic samurai movie thing of the weight that uh-huh. makes it worth it. And then they go at it, and there's fire, which is very much reminding me of the sequence in Ron when the yeah. big house burns down. And then the, the, the enemies are coming and he has to finish it. 
Who boy. Yeah, and it is just like the, the 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 little insights we can get into the combat design based on what they've shown. Like obviously there's like you don't really get much of a HUD or anything like that. It's very E3 demo, obviously, but it does it's it's keeping that pacing of like you are because it's the way that those movies are, you know, like like a Zatoichi movie, which is like like the sort of essence of the Chandra genre of that is like more focusing on those fights than something like a Seven Samurai. Is that like you're? It's like a big standoff. Everyone's standing around. Like Zatoichi's surrounded by a bunch of dudes. In some of the later movies, he's surrounded like by a hundred people. They just get like a whole town of extras to like surround this one dude, and and it's just standing and looking. And then eventually, someone like kind of like steps forward a bit, steps forward a little bit, and just goes ha ah! and charges forward and gets cut down. And is that like very quick sidesteps counters waiting for the moment? There's a lot of that. This is more of like a Kurosawa or a Kobayashi like Haruki thing of like the. Like slowly shifting a stance and like sliding your like like feet across the ground, just slowly shift your stance and like bring it kind of high or low or like the cross stance that is in Harky, like all of that that kind of stuff is in there, and it just feels like they the people making these this game have studied so intently all of these movies that they have probably done like the equivalent work of like your degree, Jonathan, <laughs> <and>, like trying <laughs> to like design the combat of like honestly probably more. I mean, yeah. to be able to make a video game of it because you've got to speak the language. I don't mean the the language of Japanese. I mean the language of the film, right? Yeah, because you've got to know when you're animating it or something like what is the movement and it's got to become instinctual and the attention to detail just in that 10 minute demo is ludicrous uh-huh. and it really does that being back to back with Last of Us 2 felt like Sony showing the fuck off because also they the both of those games seem so distinct yes. you know and it's not like you know it would be the kind of thing of that if you had days gone there you know, or if you had Death Stranding, which obviously Death Stranding is very different, but has more of a similar kind of color palette to The Last of Us Part Two. Like, right. like pairing those off of like Ghost of Tsushima has like that watercolor effect, and Last of Us Part Two is obviously like very gritty, dirty, grounded. Like they, it shows that there is a breadth of style to what Sony is is a, like providing with their first party studios that is really impressive, and it's something that's like. Fucking, I just, I need both those games, but especially because, you know, Last of Us Part 2 was awesome, but a big part of that was reminding me how much I love The Last of Us. Yeah. Ghost of Tsushima is, like, a game in from my, like, you know, greatest dreams. It's, it's... Which, Spider-Man I also would describe that way, so, like, yes, there yeah, were at least two of those game. tonight, but yeah. yeah. So, Sony and me are on the same fucking wavelength, for sure. Like, between, like, God of War... This it goes to Tsushima and Spider Man. We are fucking lock and step right now, my man. And it really does. It is kind of amazing. I, I think for a couple years early in this generation, it felt like this was just the previous game generation part two because we yeah, were making the, sequels the, the, all the dark times of 2014. Yes, for sure, yeah. But even like when it got better, yeah, they, you you know, it was like Uncharted Four, four yeah. right? Um, Gears Four, like yeah. Halo Five, yeah. Witcher Three is kind of in a weird place because it's effectively its own thing. Uh-huh. But but yes, they were direct sequels, and I, I really th- I think we thought for a while like, well, maybe we're just not getting new IPs this time. And now the floodgates, at least at Sony, have yeah. so opened in such interesting ways where even when they are technically continuing an IP like God of War, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. Even when you know Spider Man has technically had thirty video games. It doesn't feel like this is Spider-Man 30. It feels yeah. like Spider-Man for PS4. And that's exciting. That sense of discovery, uh, to have it all in one show, it's been a while yeah. to just it, feel that. It, because it was the, the Sony thing of, like, they didn't really... Well, they did announce a couple of new things, but not new Sony things. Um, but, like, the stuff that they had already announced that they showed was so meaty and so impressive. But let's move on. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of... They sort of put in some third-party announcements here. Uh, this was actually, I thought, a really strong trailer for the game called Control by Remedy. That, that was like, amazing. Yeah, it had, like, a, a good, like, I don't want to say cyberpunk, because we have, like, it's not quite cyberpunk, but it is that more, like, sort of weird sci-fi. It's like way Blade Runner cyberpunk. Yeah, yeah it's like, like, almost, like, Blade Runner-y, and it's got a cool gun that sort of goes, and, like, comes apart as cubes, and it comes back together. What I love is that this stretch, the next couple of trailers you're going to describe, yeah. all start super weird. Yes. And so every time it's sort of like, is this Death Stranding? Uh, it probably not. Yeah. It could have been. I'm like, and my brother said, Norman Reedus isn't in it yet. I'm like, yeah, but he hasn't been in all the trailers, yeah. so who knows? But yeah, no, that looked cool. Is So who is Remedy? Remedy is... The last game they made was Quantum Break. 
for oh, okay. the, the Microsoft exclusive. So it's interesting that I am assuming that this is in no way a big like I, I do not think it has any Sony exclusivity at all, unless like maybe there'll be like a DLC thing or something. But they're like. While I think Quantum Break, which was the, for those who don't remember, the sort of sci-fi, like, live-action thing yeah. they did with Microsoft, that seemed like a bit of a misfire, and people didn't like that that much. Um, but they are pretty well-loved for um, Alan Wake, which I didn't play that, but people liked that a lot. That was an Xbox 360 game. And their main thing where they got their start was um, Max Payne 1 and Max Payne 2. And and I, I played and loved the, both of those games. And, and so, I think for Quantum Break, everyone's opinion was that was ambitious and interesting. Yeah, not, not that it was like... You know, because nobody has done the TV show, live-action, yeah. like, video game thing. That has never been done well. So. so, yeah, it wasn't like they are dead as a company. It was yeah, no, that just didn't quite... Yeah, they, they are a studio with quite a bit of, of prestige behind them. And yeah, and I've seen the um, the publisher of the game is 5 of 5 Games, so that is definitely a third-party thing, okay. but they showed it off at Sony, which Very cool. feels like a little bit of a kind of like sticking it to Microsoft or something that's like, we're going to show... Almost kind of the way like the Spider-Man is of like Insomniac just like their last game was a Microsoft first-party exclusive, and now they're on Sony stage. Although for Spider-Man, it's actually just a Sony game. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, so that, that game looks cool. It's obviously, it's a very sort of like conceptual trailer, but it's cool. Yes. It's one of those that I want to watch again because it was kind of hard to, to absorb in the moment because I wasn't sure what it was. Um, next up, we got a trailer that was another, like, is this going to be Death Stranding at some point? What is that? There was a moment where I was like, is this a trailer for Spider-Man? Is, like, Peter Parker investigating something that, like, they're in a closet and yelling about something? What is happening? But no, it is um, the Resident Evil 2 remake that was sort of soft announced a couple of years ago. Um, that that they were incredibly quiet on. Yeah, and, and I, so I had kind of forgotten about it. I got to tell you, I did not have any idea what this was until yeah. Leon showed up. Yep, and Ricky I thought, Cop, Leon S. Kennedy, and I thought it was an amazing fucking trailer. Yes, I have almost zero experience with Resident Evil outside I have tried playing four and never gotten that far into it. Four is very good. This is one I will probably make time for. That was a hell of a... But if it gets good reviews and stuff, yeah. that was a great way to announce that game. I mean, Res- the, the remake for Resident Evil 1 is probably the best horror game ever played in the sense of that it almost gave me a heart attack because okay. it's so... Like, just in the game design, it was so fucking stressful in a way that, like, I have the utmost admiration for that remake. So, hopefully, like, this is the same thing. Like, people love Resident Evil 2 to death. Yes. And and I love Rookie Cop Leon S. Kennedy because I love Resident Evil 4. So yes. So I, good. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. And also, i got to say, one of my favorite sequences shown at E3 was the beginning of this where it's a rat crawling around looking at stuff, including yeah. a PS1, which was funny. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then at the end, the fucking rat gets crushed and you're in the rat's POV until the moment of death. That was the most effective use of killing the player character since Modern Warfare. Yes. That yeah, was... Like crawling away after the nuke. Yeah. I, I, my brother contested this. I literally went, no! Yeah, like the rat too. got crushed. Yeah, it's like, that would have been the darkest trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 ever. <laughs> it's like he Ratatouille gets crushed or whatever. Is the character named Ratatouille? He's Remy. Okay, Remy yeah. the rat from Ratatouille just gets killed. And it's like, fucking... <laughs> Like Kingdom Hearts Three is taking these characters going places. No, yeah, all right. It, it was good. It also got a release date for January twenty fifth, two thousand nineteen, which nice. is you know right before Kingdom Hearts Three. Yeah. But oh well. Resident Evil people and Kingdom Hearts Three people are maybe different people. I don't know. Um, next up, we had a very weird trailer for a game called Trevor or Trover Saves the Universe. I found that one annoying. That's from yeah. The... It's a Rick and Morty thing. They've made like three or four VR games, and this just seems like another one of those. I'm not. I don't like that humor style, so it did nothing for me. I don't like the people who like written Rick and Morty. Yeah. So, if but if you are, I mean, if you like Rick and Morty, and you're one of our listeners, you're probably not one of the horrible ones. I <laughs> yeah. get it. I know most of you aren't, but you know what I'm talking they're, they're, about. Yeah, it's as with anything that has that sort of very rabid fan base. It's like Star Wars. Most people who like Star Wars, totally fine people. There are just those people that like that say they like Star Wars that ruin it for everybody else. Yes, Rick and Morty seems like that. It's just like I'm not into that sort of weird humor style. If you are, you will probably like this game. I, from my understand, the other Rick and Morty kind of because there is a Rick and Morty VR game, and then there's another VR game made by these people yes. with that same humor style. People really like those who like that stuff. So, All right. well, cool for them. It's cool for them. Another thing I can say, cool for them for is Kingdom Hearts three, the third trailer for Kingdom Hearts three. If you like Kingdom Hearts. I gotta say, I have moved from mild cynicism on Kingdom Hearts to 
mild like curiosity about Kingdom Hearts 3 to active excitement. I think the trailers they've been showing off for this game are extraordinary. I, I am staunch in my position of I love Kingdom Hearts from a distance and I will I can't play these games. And I understand. I, I also think, don't like, like Disney stuff that much. So there's nothing the, in it for me. Well, for one, they're now moving into a phase of Disney where I generally like the stuff in the games. Sure, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Like more, uh, I like. I feel like I, I'm just more into some of this stuff. It's more my era, I guess you would say. But also, like the amount of variety in the worlds they're showing, the quality of the graphics, like that is the biggest thing to me. That someone actually did a side by side comparison from yesterday's trailer where they showed Rapunzel entangled. Yeah, and it's it's they they're recreating in the game a shot from the movie. Looks better in the game. Yeah, just literally that, that that movie's like six years old. And video game technology is further along than that movie is. And that movie, when it was made, by the way, was the most expensive animated movie ever made. So, like, that alone is just the level of, and I hate to use this word, but immersion you feel like seeing uh-huh. in those worlds is just out of this world. The amount of gameplay variety they're showing yeah. off. The music. I mean, it's Yoko Shimamura. She is as good as anyone has ever been at writing video game music. That's all incredible. And... I, I, I'm just, I'm learning to love the utter gibberish of Kingdom Hearts because I've also had a slightly different experience with this series than right, you, Sean, yeah. where I did not play them in part because my brother played them so much when we were kids that, like, we shared a room when we were young. He would just be playing it and I'd be doing something else and I would get the whole story of Kingdom Hearts while watching it, but with enough distance that it, it made even less sense than it normally would. And so I do have this kind of weird affinity for over the shoulder how utterly batshit that stuff is. Yeah, my version of that is that I had a friend who lived like five houses down from me who has now moved who had a PlayStation 2 and he was very much into Kingdom Hearts and, yeah. and so it was something of every once in a while I was over at his house he'd be like, let's play Kingdom Hearts and I'm like, fine. And then there would be like fucking Hercules is in every one of those and I really don't like that Hercules because, you know, when I was yeah. 10 years old, I was still me. So I was still the guy who was like, this is not fucking like the Miss. This is like, they fucking stamped over the fucking 12 labors in a montage. This is bullshit. Like, I was still me at 10 years old. No, so I, I was not it. accepting of the yeah. fucking bullshit Disney Hercules. There's just a, like, scale to this. Like, the thing about this trailer that blew me away was... I mean, in two ways. So they start with a Pirates of the Caribbean world, and it's yeah. all stuff from the third movie at uh-huh. World's End. Yeah, it's like the weird, like, like ship in the bottle and all that shit. Yeah. But here's one way it blew me away, is that that movie, at World's End, the end of the original trilogy, is 11 years old this year. It's from right. 2007. It's from our first year in high school. Fuck. So it's That's 11 long years long. old. And yet, why is Kingdom Hearts only just now catching up with it? Because Kingdom Hearts 2 is older than that. Yeah, uh-huh. That's how long this gap has been. But within that fr- sequence, they showed a full-on, like, Assassin's Creed-style ship-on-ship combat thing. They had you jumping between the ships, doing all this different pirate stuff. Then you see all the other worlds, the Toy Story and the Monsters, Inc., and they're all very different. And I just gotta say, like, I'm doing, I'm from a distance looking at this being like, that looks like surprisingly good, and I can't imagine if you are a big Kingdom Hearts fan oh God, yeah, you have how to... insane this must be. Yeah, especially because then you will understand any of the dialogue that is spoken in this trailer by any Maybe. of the Kingdom Hearts people. I will say I asked Thomas, who has played almost all of them, and he did not know what about half of it was referring yeah. to. Like I loved, There was a really good uh, Twitter video. I think I only saw it retweeted by somebody, so I don't know who, who put it up. But it was like a, a Twitter video of two different streams of people watching and reacting to... I think it was the first Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer and one of them was like this is somebody who reacting to the trailer who has played all the Kingdom Hearts games and it was like the reveal of the lady at the end of that trailer of like that turns around and looks at Mickey coming out of like the death portal yeah. and that guy's like oh I'm losing his mind and then it's like this is a reaction from someone who's only played Kingdom Hearts 1 Kingdom Hearts 2 is like who the fuck is that girl yeah. what's going anyway, is that it it's like it's one of those of like I, I don't even know. I, I don't even know if it's possible to know how many Kingdom Hearts games have been made because there's got to be like three weird ones that were made on like Japanese cell phones that don't exist anymore and yes. shit like that. I don't know if they count, but yes, they they are there. Uh, it does make sense f- to have Kingdom Hearts on the stage for Sony because it is a PlayStation franchise. It does. It's just like, it, but it, we have seen it twice already have, this week. Three. Like normally, this would be like, of course, Kingdom Hearts three is on yeah. Sony stage. I was just. I had already seen the Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer. Yes. I mean, this was the best one for sure. Although, I will say, I, I wrote here, um, oh god, there shouldn't be human people in Kingdom Hearts. Real human man Orlando Bloom is in Kingdom Hearts. And that, when I saw, or for some reason, because I guess Johnny Depp is already enough of a cartoon, it didn't like register to me. Yes. When I saw Orlando Bloom, there's something about 
you know, I like more Lando Bloom a lot, but he's kind of a bit of a milk toast kind of like actor, right? Like, he oh yeah, he's a standard kind of white guy. Yeah. So like when I saw him, I'm like. It would be like if Sam Worthington was was in it. You know, it's just like, I don't know. Oh, that was a low blow to Orlando I, Bloom. I like Orlando Bloom more than Sam Worthington, but he's in broad... He's very at the top, but he's in the same class of, like, person, actor, kind hey, of person. Kids, kids who are actual kids. Uh, Sam Worthington is the guy from Avatar, that movie your parents might have liked, because it's ten years old now. And... Uh, he's been in nothing since. He was in the Clash of the Titans remake. And Terminator Salvation, which <laughs> right, was the second attempt to do a Terminator trilogy. We're that was on the, the one before now. Terminator Genesis. Yes. Yeah, so no, yes. So I didn't even see that one. No. I, I think that the only Sam Worthy movie I've seen is Avatar. Yes. But he's the actor I like to go to for, actor that was in movies that they tried to make a thing, and he never became a thing. No. Well, he'll be in Avatar 2, 3, 4, and 5. Yes, and then and then he will be Avatar. Disney, does Disney own Avatar? They're going to because it's going, Fox. That's right. Okay, that's why I thought they did. So yes. Yeah, so for Kingdom Hearts Four, you can have Avatar. there you get Sam Worthington and Orlando Bloom side by side. Anyway, with Sora we've probably spent too much time on Kingdom Hearts. They also did announce, and I thought we spent was, too much time on Kingdom Hearts. They spent too much time on Kingdom Hearts. E three did. But I was going to say they did also announce a digital bundle that you can get, yeah. and I've looked at it. It's up, and you can pre-order it now. And it is, you get not just Kingdom Hearts 3, but then 1.5, 2.5, yes, which are Kingdom the collections. Hearts 4, yeah. Yes, and you get the 2.8 thing. So that is effectively every Kingdom Hearts game that is not a weird mobile game. Yeah, that does not um, exist anymore. Because each of those has three full games in it. Right. So you get all of those, and it's only $100, which is actually a pretty significant that is, savings. That's, yeah, that's a good price. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I... My brother has the discs for these, but I'm probably going to leave those with him when I go to Iowa. I might pick that up because you also get those right now. They don't make you wait. They oh, just, that's, that's good. You yeah. pay the 100 you get it, and then you'll get Kingdom Hearts 3 when it comes out. Uh, if you're interested, that is, I do like that they put that together uh-huh, because yeah. there's a lot of games that is an easy way to access all those games. Yes, and it is one of the things I, you know, it's easy to roll your eyes at when they do like the remakes and remasters of some of those games, but it is nice when just a full franchise that has spanned like a number of different consoles is all localized into one thing. It's like yes. the same thing with like them doing all these little remasters of the Yakuza games. It's like, I can play all these fucking PS2 and PS3 bullshit games like on my PS4 and don't have to fucking worry about any of that shit. Just, yes. Just do it. So anyway, I that's think, cool. I, th- I do think that it should come with like a, a health warning if you buy that of like, space this shit out too much Kingdom Hearts and nobody will be able like you will be removed from society <laughs> it's yes. like you will be like nobody will understand you it's you'll be talking gibberish to everybody else like a couple of weeks before between each game don't marathon that shit that's that's suicide Roxas is alive he's in my heart <laughs> yes anyway let's move on uh, because I think the next part was um, orgasmic Death Stranding might be a video game Jonathan that was such a good trailer it was a good trailer it was so good Here's the thing, though. It did start to look like a video game in this one. Yes. There was very clearly a manipulation of a third-person camera. You could tell. And I just... Every image, every idea, all of this, for better or for worse, and I don't know how it will turn out, this is the thing Hideo Kojima was put on this earth to make, and you can tell it. It is his calling. It is his higher purpose. When this game comes out, if it comes out, in whatever form it is, he will ascend onto the heavens because he will have fulfilled his purpose on planet Earth. It is the most Hideo Kojima-ass Hideo yeah. Kojima thing, and I love every fucking second of it. It is out there. I just can't believe... The, on Sony's big E3 stage, like four times now, <laughs> you get such blatantly avant-garde imagery. You know, because I, I I mean that in the the capital A capital yeah. G sense of that term, avant-garde. This is an avant-gardist work going on here, and I know because I've told you all about the fucking and eating people movies that yeah. I saw at well. CU. And like, there's the moment where Leah Seydoux just like eats the fetus, <laughs> and there's things like like. I can't believe Sony gave him however many millions of dollars it took, because that ain't a cheap game they're making. Oh, no. Um, It looks expensive as fuck. It does. And I just love that not only did they do that, they're not, like, downplaying it. They're like, no, this is one of the pillars of our brand is Uh fucking Death Stranding. That says something, I think, pretty healthy about the state of video games. In a weird way. Yeah. It says nothing healthy about the psyche of one Mr. Hideo Kojima. Yeah. But I loved this thing. Uh, Hideo Kojima has tweeted that it was the actual game running in 4K on a PS4 Pro from the Decima engine. He's very proud of that because he's tweeted it three times. Yeah. Um, 
I love that in each trailer he has in- introduced another celebrity <laughs> uh, actor. In this case, it was Leah Seydoux. And then we also got um, uh, Lindsay Wagner. Lindsay Wagner. Yeah, the bionic woman herself. Yes, playing a younger character. So she does not look exactly mo-capped, but yes. Um, anyway, he also has character posters up that are just amazing. Uh-huh. Uh, this one of Lindsay Wagner in particular, cradling a baby with a rainbow around her, <laughs> is wonderful. Um, I I just... This, this was amazing, Sean. Yeah. I think my favorite part about it is that this is the first time we saw gameplay of Death Stranding. Yes. And it consisted entirely of a dude walking. Yes. <laughs> and like, like just, I mean, that was the, probably the, the majority of the time of this demo was just watching him walk with like big panning shots. And then every once in a while, it would cut to what looked like a normal third person camera for a video game and him walking. And then like the walk animation is very clearly like a video game walk animation. It's not hand animated and all that stuff. Like, like specific for that scene. Um, and but then at the end you do get like a little bit of a like impossible to discern stealth sequence with like the weird clapping robot thing and the fetus around your like in your like tank. It is interesting how the different parts of the other trailers have started to cohere a little bit yeah. into like maybe not something I understand as a game but maybe as a world like. But there's it, it, for every answer you kind of get about Death Stranding, twenty more questions are opened up. Yeah, we still don't know what the fuck that fetus is about. We don't. It's. There's that line about how if you die, you'll come back, but like the world will be destroyed or something. And I there's like some like weird like something will happen in fast forward. And, yeah. and I need to watch this that, trailer with like subtitles because the dialogue is hard to make out. Here's my theory on all this: that fetus is him, and that's yes. what he regrows into when he dies, and that's why he has to carry it around, and that's totally what Kojima is doing. Uh-huh. But yeah, anyway, I, I it's amazing. I cannot wait for this fucking thing if it is actually a thing. I just. I have loved the, like, four fucking years at E3 now of this just being something that Sony is so clearly so gleeful to let Kojima do his thing on stage, because it's wild. Yeah. I do, like, at some point early on in the trailer, Norman Reedus says the line, I've got the extinction factor. And then, like, and not like like, I hold it that, like, that is some sort of disease he has, is the extinction factor, but it's not as bad as whatever the lady he's talking to has. Which I think might have been the Leah Sado character. I don't know. I don't know. Sean, I have to show you this too. Um, at the E3 showcase, they have a life-size figurine of Norman Reedus. Oh, God, that's horrifying. It is. It's like very uncanny because it's actually a very well-made model of him. Uh, Kojima says, The head, body, and baggage and pod and equipment were made in a lab in the U.S. And the bridges, uniform, and backpack, the supplies, and part of the equipment were made in Japan. The photo includes when I tried them on. <laughs> and then he has some other photos of life-size Norman Reedus and Hideo Kojima trying all the stuff on himself yeah. at E3. Th- this is a moment to just sort of pimp for people who don't already do it. Hideo Kojima is my favorite follow on Twitter um, <laughs> because when he's not just pimping out his own game, like every E3, it is mostly him tweeting about like obscure 1950s sci-fi American movies or Godzilla. Yes, And he owns a very impressive collection of, of Godzilla figures that I very much appreciate. Awesome. Yeah. No, I... Uh, that that was a that was a yeah. trailer. I mean, it's the kind of thing of like I don't know how you could if there's anything to talk about. I just do love that I am like ninety percent sure that this game is going to ultimately be some kind some brand of third person shooter at some point. Like you see a gun, like he pulls out a rifle at like in the middle of the trailer in like a cinematic. You never see it in a gameplay sequence, but a gun is shown. Guns have been shown in a couple of the other trailers. This has got to be a third-person shooter. I love that the debut of the gameplay does not show that at all. In fact, I think the first thing we see that, like, is very clearly gameplay is the dude, like, skyrimming up the side of that mountain in a really weird way. I mean, I did, like, the open-world-ish aspects of it looked really cool. Like, just the scope of the... Of the world and it's very particular visual design. Like someone yeah. said, it looks like a game about Norman Reedus landing on the planet from Prometheus. Sure, and it does, and I love that because I mean, half of it looked like the beginning before he goes to the destroyed city and stuff just looked like Norman Reedus got abandoned in the middle of like the Scottish moors and had to find <laughs> his way to the town. Yes, who knows? But uh, I just I, I said this on Twitter. Maybe all the bullshit with Metal Gear Solid Five and Konami had to happen so that Kojima could fulfill his true calling on this earth. And make the thing that he was clearly put here yeah. to make, whether or not it's good. Yeah, I have been not making any claims to it being good, but I have tremendously enjoyed every single time this game has showed up. Yes. All right, what was next? Um, next was we have a brief little thing um, that I was very excited about. It is the Year of Samurai, apparently, at E3. Yes, it is. We had Sekiro 
and then we had uh, Ghost of Tsushima, and then we had a, a, a surprise announcement for me of a sequel to Neo, Neo 2. Two. Neo being the sort of samurai Dark Souls game made by uh, Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja. And it was just like a very quick cinematic tease of a dude looked like getting turned into an Oni from the game and pulling like a giant horn sword thing out of his head, and that looked cool. Is the Japanese title of this one just Ni It's 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 like Nino Kuni two. It's Nino Kuni Ni and Nio Ni. Yeah. No, it's it's Neo two. Okay. Neo two. Yeah. Um that that was a fast turnaround on that one, I feel like. Yeah, I, I mean, it's one of those kind of Japanese games that where, you know, the, the graphics are kind of, like, down and dirty, like, let's, like, do this shit, and they have, yeah. like, a solid platform, and it's right. like, let's just make a bunch of new maps, a bunch of new enemy types, like, five new weapons, and I will play another Neo. Okay. I'm, it's kind it of like the way that, like, year, right? yes, it's really fucking, that game is really good, and, and it kind of feels like the Yakuza games of, like, you think that those games would take longer to make? But they put out a Yakuza game like every year or two years. So right. It's it's they the fucking Japan is efficient in this shit for reasons that are probably really negative. But you know, I enjoy the video games. Yes. And then, and, and then they 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 finished it with the fucking showstopper Spider Man. I can't Spider Man. I can't believe this exists. I mean, yep. all of these games tonight were kind of like I can't believe that exists. But this but is a game that's ways. coming this out is, in a couple of months. This is a game that's coming out in a couple of months, and also is like. Think of how much time in our lives we've spent dreaming of a great Spider-Man game and yes. never really getting it. Coming close, maybe. Yeah, times. Spider-Man Two was the closest, according to my scientifically determined list I did earlier. Yes, but it's just like that sequence where he is webbing around the like island, yeah, around the Arkham Asylum, as yeah. as he's like going around and and everything's falling and collapsing. Just. The amount of stuff going on, the sense of momentum, like you feel like you are swinging through the air with Spider-Man, and just how out of this world ambitious it looks in a realization of that character. Plus, like they had just all the voices right, both in the writing and the voice acting. Yeah. Yuri Lowenthal as Spider-Man. Yes. Mr. Yosuke himself. Yes, which is great. Um I I can't I can't believe this is we're gonna get to play this in a couple months, Sean. Yeah. And it was also something that I thought it was a really good tease because I'm assuming that this comes from a sequence that must happen pretty early in the game because it seems like a good way to sort of be like, these are the villains you're going to fight over the course of the game and they yeah. escape from the raft because specifically you have Spider-Man and that character. I think the character is named Yuri, which is, you know, the, the, but like the, the sort of the, the lady that it's called always in his ear in Oracle. the other trailers. His Oracle. Yes, he's basically his version of Oracle. Um and they're going to the raft, which is like the sort of floating prison that is in the Marvel Universe. In a way that at first I thought this might have been the Avengers game. It's like, oh shit, it's the raft. Like, that's yeah. the Marvel prison. Um, but no, they're going there. And Spider-Man specifically has like a couple of lines being like, these are like all the guys I've put away. And it is kind of that like Arkham Asylum-y Batman thing. But it feels like this is, fucking Electro is there. Rhino is there. Scorpion is there. And Vulture is there. And they all escape. And they have like advanced new suits that they have, and then Mr. Negative, who was the villain, who's a newer Spider-Man villain that's been in the other demos, he shows up, and then, and Spider-Man's just getting his ass kicked, because it's Spider-Man, and it's, and it is basically, it seems like it is their formulation of this game's version of the Sinister Six, because then another character mysteriously lands, and you're kind of looking from their point of view, walks up towards Spider-Man, Spider-Man looks into them and says, wait, you? And then cuts to black, and I think it's Dr. Octopus. It's probably Doctor Octopus. I, that would make sense. It would make sense, especially because everybody's getting new suits. It's all the like you know, like Rhino, Scorpion, and Vulture all are like suit based villains, and that, that have like an animal theme. And Doctor Octopus is a suit based villain with an animal theme. Yeah. And Doctor Octopus is the best Spider Man villain. So yeah. I think it's Aunt May, <laughs> and she has coordinated all of this for reasons unknown. Yes, she is, she is the new Green Goblin, Aunt May. Yes. That that's probably happening in the comics at some point, right? It's, everything is happening in the comic book at some point, yeah. But no, that was there was also you got um, our first real good look at the combat in this. Yes, yeah, that him, first the, combat sequence in like when all the inmates come out. That it, like almost feels like it is a like direct reference to the beginning of Arkham Asylum, where is. the first combat sequence is the doors come loose on the the bars, all the inmates come out, and you fight. 
Because, like, this might be the opening of the game. I might be surprised if this is literally, like, how the game actually I would not be surprised how it starts. felt like it could be, yeah. yeah. It's either the very beginning, first thing in the game, or it's very early on in the game. Well, because it's outside of the open world, so yeah. I, unless if somehow you can just go to the raft whenever you want. Yeah. It's, it, you know, Spider-Man gets in a boat, I guess, because he's not very good on water. No. That, that was one of, the, actually, like, the fun things about, or the, the stupid things about Spider-Man 2 was whenever you would fall into the river, it would have to, like, take five minutes to fucking spawn back on land and... Tobey Maguire had, like, one line he recorded for that. So Spider-Man is yes. not good with water, according to other Spider-Man video games. Well, you know, have you ever thrown a spider in water? Doesn't like it. No, I haven't, actually. I, I don't go around throwing spiders into water, you fucking serial killer. Let's move on from that. Let's move on from that. Anyway, the fighting looked great. I yes. love that it is. It's It almost looks more like Catwoman in the Batman games. Yeah. It's very acrobatic, but mixed with all the web stuff. It, it looked kind of like it had a lot of, like, the Batman DNA in there, but it had a bit more almost like Devil May Cry or other character action because it's like he was like pulling off sick air combos and shit and like webbing people up and knocking them around in the air there's like a lot of using the web to sort of like dash towards a specific enemy which was cool I think it's been so this was announced I think E3 2016 I want to say yes and then we had a big showcase last year and a big one this year but it has been such a cool journey to uh-huh. like two years ago get that news of like a real game company, Insomniac, uh-huh. is making a real Spider-Man game and they can do whatever they want yeah, with it. Move it's, over, Activision. You've yes. just fucked up this license for way too long. Yes. And and then last year it looked so good. It looked even better this year. We yeah. get to play it in September. Man, oh man. I, I'm still kind of can't believe that this game is coming out. Because yeah. this is just, this has been like a lifelong wish list game. Uh-huh. And it just, it looks gorgeous. The animation is unbelievable. I, I was also, and we were kind of like watching a little bit before starting the podcast, the post show they did, where they were showing some open world gameplay and kind of doing some side missions. And it just looks so fucking fun. Especially because like, and I'm very excited about the like the Spider-Man story. It looks like a way better pitch for a Spider-Man story than any Spider-Man game I've ever, I've ever played has had. But I, the thing I'm most excited about is just I want to swing around New York City exactly. and do some little side missions and just fucking relax and chill this out, is, man. This is one of the first open world games in forever where I am maybe mo- most excited to just go explore and do side missions. Yeah. Because I just want to be in the world and be Spider-Man. Yes, because th- as much as I enjoy being Batman in the Batman games, I nothing will ever be better than Spider-Man to me and I just want to I want to be the Spider-Man. Man, between the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, which are really cool, yeah. we've got Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse coming out. We got yeah. this fucking game. Spider-Man, a couple years ago, it was a very bad time to be a Spider-Man oh, fan. Amazing Spider-Man 2 was a dark time in my life. You know dark time. And wasn't that around the same time they did that stupid series, The Superior Spider-Man, where Doc Ock yeah, was Spider-Man? Yeah, where Peter Parker died yeah. and, and Doc Ock got transferred into his body or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so everything was bad. And now, I don't know what the comics are like, but all the other stuff is good. Yeah. I can't wait. It's a good time to be a Spider-Man fan. It's a good time to own a PlayStation 4. It is. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have one yet, I, I don't know. That you don't like a lot of games we like, which is fine. Which is fine. But, you know, these were some... They Here's what they did. They gave you four compelling reasons to buy a PS4. Yeah. And I guess if you were to compare this to Microsoft, one way to do it is... They gave, you know, Sony gave four quantifiable, very persuasive reasons to go out and buy yeah. a PS4 right now. Microsoft... Didn't they had more stuff in their show? But I don't think you could count four reasons to go buy an Xbox. They had three Gears Five games. They had Gears Pop, Gears Tactic, and Gears Five. So only one of those is on your Xbox, though. That's, that's, that's a very good point. And I you could also just that. go play it on your PC. Yeah. Um, here's one thing that is worth talking about, though, Sean. Okay. Spider Man is coming out. Yes. It could get a little delay, but it seems like that is. I solid. think it's going to hit it September. I think so. Like it looks so polished and ready based on that. Yeah. Post. Like because they, they, that like post show footage I saw was just them playing the fucking game. I agree. I'm just saying you never know if they'll be. Sometimes two week things happen, but we know it's coming, right? Yeah, yeah. It will. It'll be on our year end list. Something like that. Uh-huh. It's coming 2018. Uh, Ghost of Tsushima, Death Stranding, and Last of Us Part Two do not even have a year. Yeah. Is that a little weird for the four pillars of their press conference? Only one is an imminent game? Kind of. Like, I think either Last of Us Part Two or Ghost of Tsushima, or maybe both come out in 2019. I yeah. would not be surprised at all. Like, I feel like that. It was, like, Death Stranding, all bets are out. Because I have no idea. Like, it's impossible to tell based on that trailer how far along the game is. Because they show you, while they do show you some gameplay footage, which is more than anything they've done beforehand, it is impossible to know how representative that is of the finished game. Like the Last of Us Part Two and Ghost of Tsushima stuff worked very clearly. E3 demos, like it was not Spider-Man that looked like someone just kind of playing the finished game without too much trickery. 
it, it, they, those demos did look kind of far along because they weren't edited, they weren't cut up. It wasn't like the Anthem one from last no. year that just felt like it's impossible to tell if this is like previs or the actual game. Like those looked like pretty strong showings of that game, especially because Last of Us Part Two has been teased twice beforehand, right? right. So they, well, yeah. they've been showing it around for a bit. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I because the thing is, you would the way. Um, Naughty Dog has released games in the past. They typically put them in that spring slot, like April, right, May. Yeah. And that would probably... N- I, I, I don't imagine this coming out by May of next year. No, they would have fast. had the date if, they, if it was going to yeah. be that soon. So who knows? But it, it feels like... I do like the caution of just like, if you don't have a date, don't tell us a date. That's don't what make it felt one like up. to me. Like, yeah, I agree. I think one of those three at least comes next year. I'm, it's hard to tell with Ghost of Tsushima because what we saw did look extraordinarily polished. Yeah. But it's also clearly a kind of... I don't know if it's an open world game technically, but it is a It big, looks like... Yeah. I mean, because the, the beginning of that trailer, you did see enough HUD stuff and like right. the way that like the new area popped up and stuff. like they, That looked like... It reminded me a lot of like the first God of War demo we yes. saw. So I would assume a game like that takes longer to make than a game like The Last of Us, yeah. which is more linear, but who knows? But they've uh, also, you know, they've been silent since, like, spring of 2014 when they put out Infamous Second Son. And yes. I guess they put out, like, a DLC for the first light, but that's like a, like a $20 DLC package. Right, I don't think they've it's They've been working on this game for a fucking while. Yes, and Last of Us 2 would be since 2016? Yeah, Uncharted 4, yeah. Yeah, so we will see. It's, it's very interesting. I still, whenever we get to play them, they look like awesome fucking games. Yeah. So I am excited, even if Death Stranding, I think even odds on it being on the PS5 instead of the PS4. Yeah, good but, uh, you know, we'll see. We shall see. I I need to play Ghost of Tsushima and Spider-Man right now. Yes. At least one of them is pretty soon. <laughs> All right. Well, tomorrow we have Nintendo. I am so psyched for Nintendo because it is the one I am most personally invested in. Even though Sony definitely reminded me, like, okay, there's a reason I have that PS4 under my yeah. TV. I might use it a little less than my Switch sometimes, but I'm very glad I but have it. Goes to Tsushima is not going to come out on the Switch. You no, know? it is not, yeah. and that's fine. There is a place for everything in this world. But I am so excited to see Smash Bros. Yeah. And maybe a little Metroid news. I'm, I'm I excited know. to know for definitive that that Smash Bros. game is a new Smash Bros. game. Because of course it is, but they still haven't technically said it. I just want to know the weird. title. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> I just like want that, it confirmed yeah. that this isn't Smash Bros. DX. It, does, it has no what, relation to me. How? It's just like mildly annoying that they didn't say it. What a weird disappointment it would be if it literally was just Super Smash Bros. Deluxe. Uh-huh. And it was just the Wii U game with a couple extra things. People would still buy it, but it would be like... Of course. Yeah. Oh, God. You got our hopes up. But I'm excited. Apparently, um, Masahiro Sakurai is going to be on the show. Oh, cool. Which is great. We all love Sakurai. And he's had his ups and downs with, I know, some of his health and stuff. So I'm glad. Apparently, he's had a much more healthy work schedule for this game, which That's is good. good. I yeah. do not want Smash Bros. to kill Masahiro Sakurai. No. But uh, I'm excited to see stuff at Nintendo tomorrow. We will also do E3 wrap-up. Maybe we'll just independently, Sean... You make a list of something, I'll make a list of something. We'll do okay. some kind of rankings, and I'm not going to coordinate it more than that. Okay. I, yeah. I, I will make some sort of list in some way affiliated with what happened at E3. I think you should do that. I will do that. And we'll wrap it up tomorrow with day three of E3. Uh, until then, Goku is going to be in Smash Brothers. You heard it here first. <laughs>